clear that anti-Muslim hatred has absolutely no place in our communities, and I feel this very strongly representing one of the most diverse constituencies in the country. We have provided over £6 million to the Anti-Muslim Hatred Monitoring and Support Service, Tel Mama, and just shy of £30 million to schemes protecting mosques and faith schools. Funding for both measures has been uplifted in response to increased reporting since October. Peter Grant. Take two. Um, an extreme right-wing Conservative MP was allowed to go on an extreme right-wing Conservative funding TV station yep. and make a series of vile Islamophobic remarks. The MP wasn't suspended for Islamophobia. He was suspended for refusing to be an order from his party leader. Does the Minister understand why it is that not only among Muslim communities but across a much wider range of believers and non-believers, people are becoming increasingly concerned that in the eyes of this government, Islamophobia is somehow being seen as less abhorrent than other forms of racism? The government was absolutely clear that those comments were not appropriate comments, and that is completely clear. Uh, any form any form of religious hatred is not acceptable in our society. The recent rise in anti-Muslim hate incidents and crimes is really worrying. And, and will the government do everything it can to improve education, to improve multi-faith understanding and tackle this scourge? Minister. My, honourable, uh, my right honourable friend makes a very good point. I think education is critical, and we need to bring our communities together. Last weekend, I was delighted to attend an interfaith event in my constituency, which included Holland Park Synagogue, where it was hosted, and Almanar Mosque. And I think that interfaith work and communities working together is critically important. Shadow Minister List West. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. But for almost two years, this Tory government has failed to appoint an independent adviser on Islamophobia. The former adviser has since criticised the government for their failure to engage, revealing that he couldn't even get them to provide terms of reference for his role. Does the Minister agree with me that this government lacks the political will to tackle this pernicious hatred, or even to call it out? <laughs> I strongly disagree with the Honourable Lady, and I just like to let you know that we do plan to appoint a new independent adviser on anti-Muslim hatred, and we will be updating the House shortly. SNP spokesperson, Adam Kays. I, like so many, am fearful that the inability to call out Islamophobia becomes essentially a scaremongering tactic used to stoke fear and division, garner support for the extreme far right, and makes life difficult or even dangerous for Muslims. Across all four nations, more can and should be done on a cross-party basis to tackle this hatred. This starts by being able to call out Islamophobia when it occurs. So can the Minister clarify what is the line between being wrong and being Islamophobic? Minister. Look, there is absolutely no question that those comments were wrong. I face uh, the Mayor of London in, oppo uh, in opposition all of the time, and I can criticise him for so many things. I can criticise him on housing, on policing, on FAR, on transport, but I would never, ever accuse him of being in any way under the influence of Islamists. And I'm that response will give people very little comfort. Let me paint a picture for the Minister of what life is like for many Muslims growing up and living across all these four nations. A month after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, my local mosque in Carfin was petrol bombed. The two men were sentenced to one year and nine months, respectively. And ask most Muslims, they'll have their own stories. And Muslims aren't asking for special treatment. They work, they pay their taxes, they send their kids to the same schools and support the same football teams. And whilst the government have had ample opportunity over the last few weeks to commit to tackling this stain on society, there's been no substantial change in policy. Friday the 15th of March next week marks you 
UN's International Day to Combat Islamophobia. So will the government use this opportunity to, by committing to the adoption of the APPG definition? Yeah. I want to make it very clear that this government will not tolerate religious hatred towards Muslims or any other faith group, and that is absolutely clear and a red line. I also want to make it very clear that this government is aware, very sadly, of incidents of anti-Muslim hatred, and that is why we put in place an extra £4.9 million of protective security funding for Muslim mosques, faith schools and communities. Yeah. We are absolutely 100% behind our Muslim communities. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, number seven, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, with your permission, I will take questions 7, 9, 14 and 23 together. The Department publishes official statistics on homeless, homelessness duties owed, including the number of households that are threatened with homelessness following service of a valid Section 21 notice. We are committed to the abolition of Section 21 through our landmark renters' reform bill, which will deliver a fairer private rented sector for both tenants and landlords. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, in 2019, the government promised to abolish Section 21 no-fault evictions, but the bill that he was talking about, that they've come up with, um, finally published five years later, does not actually abolish Section 21 no-fault evictions. Meanwhile, 140,000 children are living in costly temporary accommodation mm. and it's now in Wallasey in my own constituency we're getting one or two cases every week of this mm. happening mm. Yeah. the problems are piling up so when is this government going to do what it promised stop delaying stop dithering and abolish no fault evictions yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, as I've already said, we're absolutely committed to abolishing Section 21. Uh, we've got the Rent was Reform Bill that's going through the House of Commons at the moment, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to debating with her when it returns to this House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my borough of Enfield topped London's League for Section 21 evictions last year, setting a grim record and resulting in a dramatic rise in homelessness, uh, homeless families approaching the Council for help. At its peak, the borough had 400 families approach the Council for help in one month. Yet the government ministers are unwilling to stand up to their own backbenchers on this. The minister says they are committed to abolishing this. Can I please ask him, when, when will you bring the bill back to this House so we can bring an end to no fault evictions? Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I pay tribute to the Honourable Lady, who I have heard campaigning on this issue a number of times, uh, and I am I'm well aware of her uh, concerns for her constituents, um, and as I have already said, we are absolutely committed to abolishing Section 21. We will bring forward the bill as soon as we are able to, uh, but what I would also say to her is the Mayor of London is not building enough homes. They are not building homes to the government's assessed need for London. He is not even building homes to his own target. So I would encourage her to have a conversation with him as well. Rebecca Longbelly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Salford, from April to November last year, approximately 466 individuals presented to Salford City Council in crisis because of Section 21 notices. But Salford social housing waiting list is currently in the thousands. <coughs> Private market rents are outstripping incomes and local housing allowance rates at a frighteningly exponential rate. And because there are no affordable homes to go to once you're evicted from a property, homelessness levels are now at acute levels this in is Salford. This, is this isn't issue. just a housing crisis now. This is a homelessness crisis in yeah, Salford. Yeah, yeah. So when is the government going to bring back the Brenters Reform Bill with robust amendments to finally ban Section 21 evictions and what action is the Minister going to take to ensure my constituents urgently have long-term secure tenancies? <laughs> Mr Speaker, again, I've heard the Honourable Lady uh, talk about this issue a number of times. Uh, we are absolutely committed to the abolition of Section 21. I'm personally committed to that, and we will bring back the bill as soon as we're able to. 
Shall the Minister Matthew Pellicoot? Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In resisting Labour's efforts to strengthen the Renters' Reform Bill, exactly. Ministers have repeatedly argued that the legislation as drafted strikes precisely the right balance between the interests of tenants and those of landlords. And yet, by watering down protections for renters and further delaying the long overdue abolition of Section 21 evictions, the package of draft government amendments to the bill that we saw last week will tilt the playing field decisively back toward the landlord interest. Are we to believe, Minister, that the government have honestly decided at the 11th hour that it is landlords that need more rights and powers? Or isn't this simply a crude attempt to manage an increasingly fractious Tory party at a shameful cost to hard pressed private tenants? Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman, uh, like uh, various members who have already spoken, is a committed campaigner on this issue, and I uh, enjoyed our time together uh, in committee uh, for this bill. Uh, I would say to him that we need to strike that balance, the very balance that he's just spoken about. That's why we're discussing uh, the bill with both uh, landlord groups and tenant groups. We're meeting with colleagues on my side of the house, we're meeting with colleagues on his side of the house and the smaller parties as well. We're ensuring that when we bring this bill back it is, the, it is in the best possible shape so that it affords those protections and that security for tenants but protections and fairness for landlords too. Mohammed Yassin. Eight, please, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for Bedford for his question. I am pleased to report that the review of the flood recovery framework has already begun and that I expect this work to be completed by the autumn of this year. We will, of course, update Parliament in the usual way when that review is completed. Mohammed Yassin. Thank you. My constituent Lucy owns Ride Lake events on White Boston Lake, which flooded again during Storm Hank. She can't get insurance, and her business isn't entitled to compensation under the flood recovery framework because of the government's arbitrary decision to expect cash strapped councils to cover the cost if fewer than 50 properties are impacted. This is very unfair that my constituents have fallen through the safety net. She won't be the only one, with property in Kempston regularly being impacted by flooding. So will the minister crack this anomaly in the framework and help my constituents save her business? Minister. Well, I'm sorry to hear uh, of the case that the Honourable Gentleman has brought before the House, and if he wishes to write to me with um, the details of the business, I will, of course, uh, look into it. In relation, Mr Speaker, to Storm Heng, 2,241 properties have been identified as being eligible for grant support. That covers 16 upper-tier local authorities, and to date, £788,703 have been reported by local authorities to impacted householders and businesses. There always has to be a rubric to these things. There, there, there always has to be, but in part, that is what will be looked at during the flood recovery framework review. And as I say, we will report that to the House. But the offer is there. If the Honourable Gentleman wishes to write to me, I will very happily look at what he has to say. Alexander Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Wiston has been uh, flooded repeatedly over the last decade. And, does, and, and it is a huge ongoing issue. Now, recently, the council has approved 450 new homes in Wiston. Now, a Wiston Parish Council, which is independently aligned, so not party political, has actually called a special public meeting about these plans, because the plans of those homes by Rotherham Council show water running uphill, which I believe it doesn't run uphill, take it away, and on top of it, it also shows flood water draining away into a non existent uh, stream, surely showing that, that the Rotherham Council don't actually understand the flooding issue. Does agree with me that Rotherham Council and all councils have a responsibility to not be building on the floodplain. Minister? Well, Mr Speaker, my uh, honourable friend raises an important point, and between the local planning authority and the environment agency, between the two bodies, they should always find the most appropriate sites uh, for development and take hydrology and water management uh, into very clear consideration. My honourable friend, the planning minister, will have heard uh, what my honourable friend has raised and, and may be contacting him in due course. Alistair Stratton. Number 10, please, Mr Speaker. Minister? On the specific adoption of roads, this is largely an issue for my right humble friend, the Transport Secretary, and he leads on that policy. However, I know, because we've spoken about this in committee, that the Honourable Gentleman has a, a significant interest in this area, and we understand the strength of feeling on this issue, and we are considering the matter further. Alistair Stratton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, across the country, homeowners in a state adoption limbo are being left exposed to exploitative and often unaccountable management companies. 
Despite their warm words, sadly, the government didn't bring forward any of the actions the CMA urged to end the issue of freeholds once and for all. Now, with the Secretary of State rumoured to be on the lookout for legacy accomplishments, will the Minister urge colleagues to finally <coughs> act on this issue in this Parliament, or will freeholds be an issue yet again left to the next government yeah, to tackle yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. With the best word of the world to the Honourable Gentleman from Mid Bedfordshire, the CMA report was published uh, a few days ago, and the, and the uh, leasehold uh, bill has been progressing through this House for a number of months before that. But on the specific point, I hope he would accept, as other members in the House have done so, including on his benches, that the leasehold bill is a significant improvement for estate management, the right of redress to tribunal, further information, the right of absolute clarity on service charge, all of which have been demanded and asked for quite rightly by residents, and we are bringing forward changes. And I say we are considering very carefully whether there's anything further we can do. Tom Hull. Question number 11, Mr Speaker. My department is engaging with all town deal recipients to support delivery through our performance monitoring process, and we have a particular interest in progress in Ipswich, following the allocation of £25 million secured by the member for Ipswich for ten projects in Ipswich. Thank you, Mr, Mr. Speaker. I'm very grateful for that investment. Um, the Secretary of State will know that my, my honourable friend and member for Bishop Auckland had to intervene because of the slow production of the business cases. We got over that hurdle. However, sadly, years later, we're still desperately waiting for delivery on the ground. When it's bodies other than the Labour-led council responsible for projects, they get delivered. No problem. But when it's a Labour-led council in the driving seat, what we see is no delivery. Whether it is cock-up or conspiracy, ah. it's not good enough. Will the Secretary of State please intervene to let them know that it's not right to put politics before the delivery that Ipswich people desperately need? So the State. Well, my honourable friend is a bonnie factor for Ipswich, and he's absolutely right on the local shopping parades project and also the former Paul's silo building. I'm afraid we have not seen the progress that we would expect. And it's simply the case that the Labour Council in Ipswich is not delivering for the people of Ipswich in the way that he so brilliantly does. Mr Speaker, I thought the Secretary of State's government was introducing all these deals in order to help parts of the country that were struggling, where more people who have less earnings live. I have been, like him, I have been watching very carefully who's getting the money. How come so much of the money goes to Tory marginal seats? Is that fair? Um, Firstly, Ipswich is an area that deserves investment, an area that has been overlooked and undervalued under Labour governments. Secondly, um, on Friday I was proud to be able to announce additional investment in a mass transit system which will enable his constituents in Huddersfield to travel more quickly across West Yorkshire to Leeds and Bradford. It is the case, sadly, at the moment that we do not have Conservative MPs in Leeds or Bradford, um, but we do know that uh, the Labour marginal seats in Leeds and Bradford, and of course the marginal seat of Huddersfield, will very soon have Conservative representation. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question 12, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, I will take questions 12 and 22 together. Our £150 million community ownership fund is open to voluntary and community organisations or parish, town, and community councils from all parts of the United Kingdom who have a viable plan for taking ownership of a community asset at risk and running it sustainably for community benefit. So far, we have awarded £71 million to 257 community projects, including £1 million to Gig Lane, the home of Berry FC. Yeah. Detailed guidance on criteria is available in the prospectus on gov.uk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Silk Some Common Methodist Church in my constituency hasn't been used for worship for some time, but it's a really important community space where a wide range of community groups meet regularly. Now, sadly, I understand that the Methodist Church may now sell the building, threatening the future of these groups. Uh, but the Parish Council, Silkstone Parish Council, have managed to have the building listed as an asset of community value. So, could my honourable friend tell me whether the Community Ownership Fund might be a suitable source of funding to secure the future of the building, or what other funds? the uh, Parish Council should indeed, should indeed be looking at. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I, I can confirm it sounds as though it's eligible, uh, but I'm happy to meet with her to discuss eligibility further. Uh, applicants can bid up to £2 million in capital funding from the Community Ownership Fund, with re revenue funding available in addition to, to this. But in the first instance, I would recommend that interested applicants read the prospectus on gov.uk, as this will cover all they need to know regarding eligibility requirements, funding available and the application progress. Really? 
Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Would my right honourable friend consider amending the criteria for community ownership fund applications to include the potential community purchase of redundant council assets, which would bring back to life many publicly owned buildings and spaces which are currently serving no purpose or are underused? Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Member for his advocacy for the fund, as well as for his constituents in Bury. The Community Ownership Fund works alongside existing community asset transfers to support these by funding costs of renovation and refurbishment. We can't fund the cost of purchasing publicly owned assets where the public authority would credit a capital receipt, except in the case of parish, town and community councils. But I'm happy to meet with him to discuss this further. Tim Farrell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In many communities in Westmoreland, the pub is the centre of that community and often is under threat. In some cases, that pub, such as the ship at Sandside, has closed down altogether. Community Ownership Fund clearly is a very good way of being able to allow the community to bring those businesses back into public use. But does the fund allow communities to go through the process of compulsory purchase so that a building can be taken from an owner who is unwilling to sell so it can then be made useful again for the local community? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the CPO pro process is probably a little bit too lengthy for the fund itself, but I'm happy to meet with him to, uh, to discuss the project uh, uh, directly. Uh, we're very, uh, very happy to help fund community pubs through the Community Ownership Fund. Thank you. Um, the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow is a much beloved institution yeah, and has yeah. been undergoing uh, refurbishment over several years now. They've had a range of funding from Glasgow City Council, the Scottish Government and Historic Environment Scotland, uh, but due to inflation and other measures still require additional funding to make up the balance to complete this really significant refurbishment programme. Uh, is this, the Community Ownership Fund something that the Citizens Theatre might be able to avail themselves of? Minister. Mr Speaker, once again, I, I think it sounds as though it may be eligible, uh, but I can't comment exactly on eligibility uh, today, but I'm happy to meet with the Honourable Lady to discuss whether this fund is appropriate for her uh, Citizens' Theatre. Nigel Bills. Number 13, please. Secretary of State. We have made available up to £64.7 billion for local authorities through the Local Government Finance Settlement for 2024-25. That is an above inflation increase of up to £4.5 billion, or 7.5 per cent in cash terms, on 2023-24. And of course, this includes an additional £600 million of funding, which was announced by my honourable friend, the Member for Local Government, on 24 January. <clears throat> Thank you for that answer. Aside from potholes, the issue that has caused the most angst for Derbyshire County Council is the significant rise in the costs of residential placements for looked after children. And the Council believe that the market for that is now completely out of control and prices are excessive. Is there more the Government can do to help councils financially to pay these bills or find a better way of structuring that market so the bills are not so high? Well, Honourable Friend, this is a very important point. I mean, it is the case that we're spending £500 billion additionally, a million pounds, forgive me, um, on, on uh, adult and children's social care. But he's absolutely right. The cost of residential homes for looked after children is excessive, and there are a number of private equity firms that are operating like bandits in this area. And I have talked to the minister responsible, the member for Wantage. Action will be forthcoming. Chair of the Select Committee, Clive Burns. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Select Committee recently produced a report on local government finance, and we said the local government, must, the government must act now if local authorities are to survive the severe crisis. What has the Secretary of State done? He's asked every local authority to produce a productivity plan. It sounds a bit like him advising councils how to spend better the money they haven't got. Uh, in particular, he's asked local authorities to identify ways to reduce wasteful spend. What does he think local authorities have been doing for the last 13 years? And in more in particular, to ask them to identify waste on discredited staff equality, diversity, and inclusion programmes. How much do you think going to, that's going to save towards avoiding Section 114 notices? Yeah. Well, I'm very grateful to the Chairman of the Select Committee. And he's right, of course, um, there are challenges that local government faces. But there are outstanding councils, like, for example, North Lincolnshire or South Norfolk, that are continuing to ensure that they can build up surpluses and deliver effective services. And that's because they put productivity first. There are some local authorities, lamentably, that are not putting productivity first, like South Cambridgeshire with its plans for a four day week, or St Albans, which is still spending money on discredited forms of training that are in the increased division rather than bringing communities together. And it's no coincidence that both of those local authorities are Liberal Democrat. Talk well. Question 16, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Where landlords fail to keep their properties in an acceptable condition, local authorities can issue improvement notices and impose penalties for non-compliance. Social tenants can already access the housing, uh, housing ombudsman service, and the Renters Reform Bill will establish a new landlord ombudsman service, so private tenants can also seek free redress. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable friend for his answer. Whilst these changes in legislation are welcome, it is clear that more must be done. Too many rental and leasehold residents in Uxbridge and South Ryslip face ongoing issues in ensuring landlords and freeholders face up to their responsibilities. Will the Minister work with me to ensure that my residents in such precarious situations with unresponsive landlords and leaseholders are able to access the correct course of remedial action in a timely and effective manner? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I will indeed work with my honourable friend to ensure that his residence, which he is such a brilliant champion for, can access redress. We are committed to protecting tenants from the minority of landlords and agents who provide a poor service. Where a property is managed by an agent, residents can seek redress through the Property Ombudsman or the Property Redress Scheme, as well as the Housing Ombudsman for social uh, tenants and the new Ombudsman for private tenants. The Leasehold and Freehold Reform Bill will require freeholders who manage their property to join a redress scheme too. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Too many children across the country are still being hospitalised because of mould in their private rented homes. Repairs and concerns, especially about mould, are the subject of AWAB's law, which is being brought in, but private landlords are being left off the hook. Will the Minister consider supporting my private member's bill to extend AWAB's law and ensure that la private landlords hold up their responsibilities to fix mould. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for the uh, time that we've spent together discussing her private members' bill. Uh, through the Renters' Reform Bill, we're introducing a new decent home standard for the private rented sector, which I believe covers the majority of her bill, but I'm happy to continue the discussions further with her. 18, please. Uh, Secretary Stone. My department is supporting the implementation of the Norfolk devolution deal, which is progressing well. Norfolk County Council, under its brilliant leader, intends to vote to change its governance in July, leading to the election of a directly elected leader in May 2025. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The budget in a couple of days uh, has got two things it could do for Norfolk. Firstly, we could announce the county deal and give Norfolk control of its future. But even more importantly than that, it could provide the vehicle for my Sheringham roundabout, which the Minister knows all about, which will be wonderful for my North Norfolk constituency. So the question to the Minister is, has he convinced the Chancellor to announce it yet? So stay. Well, I, I can't reveal um, the nature of any discussions that I've had uh, with a member for Surrey South West, but Sheringham roundabout is one of the single most important infrastructure investments in Norfolk. The member for North Norfolk has made the case convincingly to me, and I hope that we'll be able to get motoring on it before too long. That's been correct. Thank you. Number 19, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our £11.5 billion affordable housing programme will deliver thousands of affordable homes for both rent and to, right, uh, and to buy right across the country. The levelling up white paper committed to increasing the supply of social rented homes, and a large number of the new homes delivered through our affordable homes programme will be for social rent. There's been correction. Mr Speaker, in Bolton, 20,000 people are on a housing waiting list. For a three-bedroom house, it's an 18-month wait, and on average, 800 to 900 people apply for each home that comes up. Families are often referred into the private central sector, which they are not able to afford, as because we know the rents are sky high. After 14 years of this Tory government, which has actually failed to build affordable homes, Will the Minister now apologise to my constituencies, constituents stuck in temporary accommodation? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Lady mentions the last 14 years. Well, since 2010, we have delivered over six, uh, 696 thousand new affordable homes, including over 482,000 affordable homes for rent, of which 172,000 uh, 172, homes are for social rent as well. We are committed uh, to building more homes uh, for people like, just like her constituents. We now come to Topicals, Debbie Abrahams. T1, Mr Speaker. Stay. 
Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On Friday at the Convention for the North, I was delighted to be able to confirm enhanced devolution deals for the Liverpool City region, West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire, and also additional investment in Blackpool, Sheffield and Blackburn, including £1.5 million for Tony's Empress Ballroom, which, as you will know, Mr Speaker, is an iconic Northern Soul dance floor. I look forward to visiting it soon with you and with the Shadow Secretary of State. On the floor tonight, Debbie Abrams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I had a constituent who came to a surgery of mine recently with her seven-year-old son um, to show some appalling photographs of the private rented uh, accommodation that they um, live in. Uh, the little boy asked me, um, with thick mould in his bedroom, if he was going to die. Um, so given the recent remarks by the housing ombudsman, um, I'm, I'm particularly emphasising the link between housing uh, conditions and health. Um, what is he going? What urgent action is he going to take to address the appalling uh, situation with private rented? Uh, well, um, we will shortly be saying more about the decent home standard and the extension of ombudsman powers to deal with the precisely the sorts of situations that she quite rightly raises. Dr. Therese Cotton. Since the last ELUC questions, uh, my local association, uh, flagship New Tide, have sold off three more homes in Alborough at auction. However, the same housing association is failing to take action on antisocial behaviour that's happening to several of my constituents in Saxmundham. What powers can we apply to make sure that people who do the right thing, want to live in their home peacefully, are not surrounded by people dealing drugs, breeding illegally uh, pets, and making sure that their other people's lives are in misery. Mm. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tackling antisocial behaviour is a priority for this government, and that's why we've published our antisocial behaviour action plan backed with £160 million of new funding. We've committed to a three strikes in the route ESB policy, and landlords will be expected to evict tenants whose behaviour is disruptive to neighbours. But from the 1st of April, my honourable friend will be pleased to know, this regulator of social housing will require registered providers of social housing to work with the appropriate local authority to departments, the police and other relevant organisations to tackle anti-social behaviour. Minister Florence session yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week's budget will be a big one for young people, 16 and 17-year-olds, who are probably starting work or making those important education um, choices. Yet, they currently have no say on who the next government is going to be. On this side of the House, we believe in our young people. So will the government act now and give 16 and 17 year olds a say in the next general election? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, the Honourable Lady makes a case for lowering the um, voting uh, age. It's one I don't support. It's one that the government doesn't support. The age of 18 is seen as the age of maturity in this country and in many other countries across the world. It seems to have served us pretty well uh, up until uh, now, and I see no particular reason to change it. Marco Longhi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Minister join me in congratulating South Staffordshire District Council for serving an enforcement notice to rebuild the Crooked House pub? Will he also look favourably at measures I will be bringing forward to ensure that heritage pubs are better protected? Because, as he will know, the Crooked House and many others had no protections at all. Well, my honourable friend makes a very important case and uh, uh, makes a very important uh, argument. And the case of Crooked House, I think, reinforces uh, what he has long campaigned for, which is better protection for heritage pubs. And I look forward to working with him and Lord Mendoza to achieve just that. Dr. Rupert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary of State is a strong supporter of green urban spaces. So, will he urgently meet with me to discuss the ancient Haven Green, currently under threat, on which he is due to decide soon? Well, obviously, I, I can't uh, speak to the Honourable Lady about specific planning applications, and I do cherish urban green spaces, but I also cherish more homes being built in London. And it would be, it would be, regrettable, it would be regrettable if the Honourable Lady were to be a block and not a builder. Jen Stevens. Mr Speaker, since my election, I've urged Wolverhampton City Council to focus on city centre living to bring footfall back to our yeah, city yeah. centre. Um, what more can government do? I'm delighted the council are now changing their plans, but uh, how can we get upper storeys converted as well to really bring that footfall back? 
Well, the, uh, uh, my honourable friend is a brilliant champion for Wolverhampton and for Wolframians everywhere, and in particular, she has been the single most effective voice in attracting investment to the heart of Wolverhampton. But she's right, as well as commercial investment, we need new residential opportunities, and our extension of permitted development rights should provide just that. Chris Stevens. Thank you. Can the Minister for the Union tell me what discussions he has had with devolved administrations and what discussions he has had with the Chancellor? on the very important matter of infected blood compensation? And does he recognise the frustration and dismay from many campaigners as to the delays and almost a year have waited since Sir Brian Langstaff reported on his compensation framework? Well, um, the Honourable Gentleman raises a very, very important point, and those who have suffered as a result of uh, the infected blood scandal um, are, of course, in the forefront of our minds. Uh, it is directly a Cabinet Office responsibility, but I know from my time in the Cabinet Office how seriously the Ministers charged with this responsibility take it, and I will talk to them and, indeed, update devolved administrations on progress towards appropriate compensation. The Government is to be commended for taking through the first leasehold reforms for 20 years. But as the bill now goes to the Lords, will ministers go further and agree, firstly, to empower the three to four million people trapped on fleecehold estates, and secondly, to fundamentally end this scammy, dodgy, corrupt model once and for all? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Frank makes an important point about making sure that we strike the right balance here. We have brought forward significant reforms, significant reforms, as is already in the bill, but I'm happy to continue to talk to my honourable friend and other members of this House who are interested in this, and the government continues to look at what more can be done. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week we saw for a second year running gross sleeping numbers up by over a quarter. That's a lot of people to criminalise if the Criminal Justice Bill remains unamended. Over 100,000 households, including 140,000 children, find themselves stuck in temporary accommodation. Yet the mere mention of temporary accommodation sees ministers pivot away from the subject entirely. This should be a source of shame for this government. So where is the national plan to end all forms of homelessness? Because I sincerely hope it's not in the same place as their plan for ending Section 21 evictions, Mr Speaker. This government has got a very clear plan. We introduced it last year, ending rough sleeping for good. We announced £2 billion behind it. It is now £2.4 billion. It is unprecedented amounts of money that we are giving to this very important task. James Morris. The Hayton Hill Leisure Centre in my constituency is to be part rebuilt and part refurbished by a £20 million investment from the levelling up fund. Um, so would the minister agree with me that DLUC need to continue to be engaged with the local authority who are appointing contractors to make sure that this project does get delivered on time and on budget? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Honourable Member, who is a fantastic champion for his constituent. I'm happy to meet with him to discuss uh, the delays uh, uh, as soon as we're able to. Uh, there is the project adjustment process available to the Council if they need to, uh, if they need to use that. Judith Cumber. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in 2010, total wealth per head in the north of England was 16 per cent less than the rest of England. Last week, the IPPR released a report which estimated that by 2030, this gap will have grown to 21 per cent. Can the Minister confirm that this Government's policies have achieved levelling up? So state. Well, I was delighted to be in West Yorkshire on Friday, outlining the additional investment that we are making uh, in the West Yorkshire region and the uh, specific uh, agreement that we have reached with the Mayor of West Yorkshire, Tracy Braben, will see significant additional funds going in to help with housing, adult skills and transport, all of which will contribute to uh, a revolution in devolution that has occurred under this Conservative Government. George Freeman. Rural areas are particularly vulnerable to the high energy costs we have seen in the last two years, 150 per cent more vulnerable to fuel poverty. Uh, would my right hon. Friend agree with me that councils on the front line of high rural costs are seeing a spate of homelessness? Great councils like Breckland in my patch now spending 50 per cent of their net budget on uh, relief, and would he support me in urging the Chancellor to increase that relief in the budget on Wednesday? Sir, stay. Um, well, my right hon. Friend makes a very important point. We are concentrating, of course, on making sure that we can level up the North and Midlands, but we also need to recognise that levelling up encompasses making sure that those in rural areas who contribute so much to the life of our nation are also supported through the challenges that the cost of living crisis has generated. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can the Minister advise on how many people 
took up the offer of the former Help to Buy ISA scheme and whether consideration has been given to another such scheme to allow young people to get on that seemingly impossible first rung of the property ladder. Minister. Uh, we continue as the government to bring forward as many interventions as we can to support young people to get onto the housing ladder. There's over 800,000 first time buyers that have managed to do that since 2010. I'm happy to meet with the Honourable Gentleman to talk more about the points he has made. Thank you, sir. Today, the Charity Commission have issued new guidance for charities who refuse to accept donations. This comes after the RNLI turned down a donation from Dungarvan Foxhounds in the Republic of Ireland. Now, declining a donation from a lawful source may not be consistent with trustees' legal duty to further their charity's purpose. Will my right honourable friend support the right of communities throughout the British Isles to donate to charities of their choice? Well, my right honourable friend, a former Attorney General, raises a very important point. We want to do everything we can to encourage charitable giving. I will look closely at the case that he mentions, raise it with the Cabinet Office, and of course with the very distinguished Chair of the Charity Commission, who has been doing such a good job, Orlando Fraser Casey. Virtual Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are businesses in York which have not been able to trade for over four months due to flooding, and the flood recovery framework precludes them from getting funds, whereas in Tory shires they are able to access funds. So, will the Minister meet with me to discuss the, the fact that my businesses can't get any funding, and let's find a way forward so that they do not miss out? Oh, well, that's good. Minister. Yes. Blue call. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Councillors will not be covered by the newly passed Neonatal Care Leave and Pay Act at risk of losing extra responsibility allowances if they have a child who spends time in neonatal care. So will the Local Government Minister issue guidance to councils asking them to ensure that uh, all parents are protected if their councillors and find themselves in those most difficult circumstances? Uh, Minister. Mr Speaker, this is a campaign which my honourable friend uh, worked on. We spoke about it last week. I understand entirely the merits of the argument that he's making. So powerful is my honourable friend as an advocate that I have already put in place and, and, in, and, and, in, and in hand work on that in order to deliver what he's talking about. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thinking about the Community Ownership Fund, it is very welcome that the match funding requirement from local organisations has been reduced to 20%. In future rounds, could the criterion around match funding take account of prior investment by the community, such as the very many small donations that people in the Axe Valley area gave to build Seaton Community Hospital? Very good. So, so. Well, that's a very interesting idea, and I'm very fond of the Axe Valley, so I'll look at it. Oh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. 12.44. That was the date of the first market charter awarded to Wellington in Shropshire in my constituency. In the last three years, Mr Speaker, £3 million under the Towns Fund, £10 million under the Leveling Up Fund, and £800,000 under a fund I can't remember, but three funds, record investment from this government into Wellington, 800-year-old uh, market town. The Council have just taken over, the Labour Council have just taken over the market. Can the Secretary of State please, please ensure that the Council don't mess it up? Sure, we will do everything we can, and Wellington is very lucky to have such a brilliant advocate. I uh, hope that uh, the, my honourable friend sits on the green benches for many years to come, but when he's translated to another place, he deserves to be the next Duke of Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> right, that completes questions. We now come to the urgent question. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for the Home Office if he will make a statement on the publication of 13 reports by the former Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration on the 29th of February and how the Inspectorate will now operate in the absence of a Chief Inspector or Deputy. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We recognise that independent scrutiny such as that provided by the Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, plays an important role in ensuring we have an effective immigration system. In January, the Home Secretary made a promise to the former Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration to publish all overdue reports as soon as possible, a point that I repeated in the House last month in response to an earlier urgent question. Last Thursday, we delivered on that promise by publishing all 13 reports 
that were outside of the eight-week commitment to review and respond. We take ICIVI reports seriously, and we do not wait until publication to act on their findings. Indeed, some of the report's recommendations have now been implemented, and work is ongoing across the Department to implement others. This includes action to strengthen border security and improve the system for processing asylum claims. The final two reports from the former Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration will be published in the established eight-week period. There is no requirement for a Chief Inspector to be in place for that to happen. But the process of appointing his replacement is already underway, with the advert going live the day after the former Chief Inspector had his appointment terminated. An appointment will be made following robust competition in accordance with the Governance Code on Public Appointments. In addition, we are looking at options to appoint an interim Chief Inspector. We will, of course, update the House on the outcome of appointment processes, and we will also continue working with the Right Honourable Ladies Committee in relation to these matters. Mr Speaker, the security and effectiveness of the UK border is of paramount importance. This Government recognises that, which is why we have taken wide-ranging action to tackle illegal migration and reform our asylum system. Our efforts are paying off, but there is more to do. We will never compromise on this. We will always put the safety and the interests of the British people first. Dame Diana Johnson. I agree with the Minister that the role of the Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration provides indispensable scrutiny of vital Home Office functions. And on Tuesday, the 20th of February, the Home Secretary sacked David Neil. Eight days later, the Home Office published 13 of the 15 reports the Chief Inspector had submitted during his tenure, none of which were published within the agreed deadline of eight weeks following receipt. And the reports do raise multiple serious concerns about the Home Office's handling of border security and immigration operations. So can the Minister confirm what action is actually being taken to address the report findings that the protection of borders at airports is neither effective nor efficient, with border posts being left unstaffed? What steps will the Minister take to remedy the serious failures identified in attempts to discover illegal goods at airports? Does the Minister accept the conclusion that attempting to clear the legacy backlog at all costs has led to perverse outcomes for claimants and staff, with quality assurance sacrificed for increased productivity? And with a new Chief Inspector not expected to be in post for six to nine months, and with no deputy to step up and exercise statutory responsibilities, will the Minister explain exactly how the Inspectorate will operate during that period? Is all inspection work now on hold? And what happens to the Inspectorate's 30-plus members of staff? Last week, David Neil told the Select Committee of his concerns regarding Wethersfield Asylum Accommodation Centre, relating to suicide, violence and the lack of expertise to manage the situation. Will the Minister now agree for the Committee's request to visit Wethersfield? The Committee also published last week the 10 changes that David Neil thinks need to be made to improve the effectiveness of the Inspectorate, including the power to publish its own reports, creating a deputy position and access to commercial contracts entered into by the Home Office. Does the Minister have any plans at all to implement any of those recommendations? And finally, can the Minister Commit, uh, comment on the joint letter sent by seven national uh, Home Office editors complaining about the decision to publish a slew of Home Office reports on the same day as the Sarah Everard report. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, I'm very grateful to um, the Chairman of the Select Committee for not only um, asking those various questions but also for the opportunity to, to respond on these points today. I have to say it is rather surprising that ministers are being criticised for doing precisely what it is that they said they would do. We said, and actually I was pressed on this a couple of times, and I was asked when these reports would be laid. I said that that would happen soon. I then subsequently said that that would happen very soon, and that commitment was fulfilled. And what I will say to her, I will give her this undertaking, because this is important, and I care about this, and I know that she cares about this as well that when it comes to those two outstanding reports, those will be responded to in full and in the proper way within that eight-week window. I would refer back to um, 
my late friend James Brockenshire's commitment that he made to this House. She will appreciate that I have come back to the Department in December. I would argue we have made progress in laying these reports, and I just want to assure the House that those existing reports that are not yet responded to will be dealt with within that eight-week window, and we will return to that approach in dealing with these matters, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, in terms of the recommendations in various reports, what I can say is that we have obviously responded to those reports. A number of the recommendations have, of course, been accepted. A number of recommendations have been progressed. A number of recommendations have been completed. Those reports speak for themselves and give an indication of the direction of travel that we intend to make. And Of course, we also want to engage with um, the next inspector around that performance to make sure that they have an important role in overseeing um, the delivery against those commitments that we have made to respond to the issues um, that were raised, understandably, within those reports. On the specific issue of general aviation, that falls within um, the reports that are still to be responded to. As I have said, that will happen within um, that eight-week um, window. That is a commitment that I undertake to fulfil. When it comes to the asylum backlog, it is fair to say that there has been pressure from this House to get on and process asylum claims. I would argue that the teams have done remarkable work in delivering on that commitment to get on and process the legacy backlog, with much learning along the way that we take forward into the future processing. But there is going to be increased sampling in the way that the inspector recommended, as well as improvements to IT. Um, when it comes to the um, arrangements for the ICIBI functions in this period. That is a matter that is currently under consideration. Um, Minister Tomlinson is actually the lead on that aspect of the Department's work, and I know that Ministers will update the House accordingly. On the request about Weathersfield, I am very happy to consider that request from the Home Affairs Select Committee to visit. Um, but I think one of the most frustrating things about all of this is that if Mr Neil had not gone to the media in the way that he did, providing that information into the public domain in a way that um, was in breach of the terms of the agreement that he had with the department to take on this capacity, um, he would still be in post and able to engage in this dialogue this week. Tim Long. Mr Speaker, can I follow on some specific questions that the Minister did not pick up from the Chairman of the Home Affairs Select Committee? Is it the case, or is it not the case, uh, that David Neil was dismissed by Teams call by a civil servant, and why wasn't he afforded the courtesy of actually seeing uh, um, a minister? Is it not also the case that, despite having a recruitment process that started last November, no suitable candidates came forward, and the posters had to be re-advertised at a higher um, salary? And thirdly, he's not mentioned anything about how the inspectorate actually operates. Is it not the case that the 30 civil servants are not able to carry on the work? on the current reports they're working on. They're not able to carry out uh, any inspections. They're not able to pick up the schedule of reports that have already been uh, programmed in, and they're not able to comment uh, on any responses from these uh, reports. And finally, can he assure me there were no redactions or nothing was removed from those 13 reports published en masse uh, last week? because there is no inspector or deputy inspector to challenge the contents of his actual reports to be put in the public domain. Minister. On the final point that uh, my hon. Friend raises, I will just want to go away and check on that point and write to him accordingly. What I would say is that, quite clearly, this is an important function. The recruitment process was um, restarted the day after Mr Neil left the role. We are keen to make progress in appointing a new Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration. I would encourage people to put themselves forward. As I say, this is an important role and one that we place value on as a government. I think that the relationship with the ICIBI um, will be in the terms that I have set out, in terms of getting on and publishing those reports within that eight-week framework in terms of the existing workload. And we also um, want to continue to engage constructively with them in relation to the role um, when their successor is appointed. I know that senior officials, the second permanent secretary, is engaging with the, um, the administrative team at the ICIBI, and as I've said, we're looking at what can be done in the interim to bridge the gap between Mr. Neil leaving and the new inspector taking post. 
Shall Home Secretary of Vet Cooper? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We think of the family and friends of the seven year old who lost her life in the Channel this weekend. Yeah. It matters more than ever to stop the criminal gangs and dangerous crossings that are undermining border security and putting so many lives at risk. Mr. Speaker, 13 inspectorate reports, one NAO report with damning revelations on Britain's borders that the Tory Home Secretary has shamefully tried to bury or hide. And now he's gone into hiding himself. He should be doing a statement on these reports. They show shocking border security failures. Border and customs posts not staffed. In one airport, they were told customs is shut down for the summer. Equipment either broken, not available or untrusted, lack of anti-smuggling capability, protection of the border is neither effective nor efficient. So tell us, how many times have customs and border posts gone unstaffed this year? Does the minister even know? How many high-risk private flights weren't checked in person? How long will there be no inspector in post? More findings. Only two people removed under the inadmissibility process they claimed would cover tens of thousands. 147 unaccompanied children who went missing still not found. And on Rwanda, £400 million of taxpayers' money spent even if no one is sent. If 300 people go, it will be £580 million, over half a billion pounds on a scheme that will cover less than 1% of UK asylum arrivals, nearly £2 million per person. I say to the Minister, don't give us any garbage about the Tories having a plan. That's not a plan, it's a farce. Yeah. Why don't they stop yeah. wasting that money and instead put it into rebuilding border security and stopping the criminal gangs? That that's Labour's plan. And finally, the revelation that the Home Office has gone a shocking £5 billion over budget this year because they failed on the backlog, on returns, on hotels and on Rwanda. 14 years of Tory government wasting taxpayers' money, weakening Britain's security. They bust the Home Office budget, broken Britain's borders. Instead of hiding and running away, why don't they just get out of the way and let someone else do the job properly instead? Yeah, yeah. I think um, that was a contribution to the House full of sound, uh, sound bites, yeah. as ever, but absolutely light on policy substance. And you know, the one thing, the one thing that we hear time and again from the right honourable lady and her colleagues is a lot of criticism of what the government is doing, and absolutely no credible policy alternative in response. And it is incredibly frustrating, and it just won't do. And the British people see straight through it. I share. I share, I share her earlier sentiments in her remarks about the terrible incident that we have seen at the weekend with that young girl losing her life. We have seen yet again in the last few weeks lives lost in the Channel, and that is a source of regret for all of us. That is why this Government is absolutely determined to put an end to these crossings of the Channel. We are making progress. That is why the number of crossings last year, compared to the year before, was down by over a third. Albanian arrivals down by over 90 per cent. But there is more work to do, and we will continue to see through the plan that is delivering on those results. She specifically mentions Rwanda. We have a fundamental point of difference in that we believe, as the government, that the Rwanda policy is an important part of the answer in putting those evil criminal gangs out of business. It is not acceptable to be spending £8 million a day in the asylum system, but actually it doesn't take many £8 million a day to get to the figures which have been provided to the NAO in a transparent manner, and we will continue to publish through the annual report and accounts. But we think it is the right thing to do to advance that policy, to put those criminal gangs out of action, recognising that it is novel and that it has been challenging, but she will, of course, have the opportunity to vote for the Rwanda legislation when it comes back from the other place, and I would certainly encourage her to be in the division lobby with us and her colleagues as well, because it just won't do to have no credible plan. And when she, when she refers to the point about one of the comments that was made in the report, we don't accept that. Um, the inspection only covered a small part of our border operations at a specific location and over a limited period of time. It is a snapshot, and it is inappropriate to draw unsubstantiated wider conclusions through sweeping statements based on a three-day inspection. Ultimately, 
Border Force facilitated 132 million passenger arrivals last year, processing over 96 per cent of passengers with service standards. And significant progress has been made since this report was commissioned to increase the numbers of officers trained in vulnerability and behavioural detection, and this is set to continue. We treat the recommendations that come from the inspector with the utmost seriousness. We get on and deliver on those recommendations, and we've also, as I've set out for the House today now consistently, got a commitment to respond to those reports within eight weeks. James Devlin. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And following on from the point that my honourable friend has just made, it was very clear that there is an issue regarding the publication within eight weeks. And bearing in mind the public purse is funding 30 civil servants together with the Chief Inspector of Immigration, I wonder whether my honourable friend has given consideration to a statutory written basis to the eight-week requirement or whatever requirement is necessary or proportionate for the publication of such reports to ensure the deficiencies within the system. Well, in his... Um usual way my honourable friend comes to this house with constructive suggestions yeah. about the way um, that government goes about its work and that is a suggestion that I'm very happy to um, put to my right honourable friend um, the minister who leads on these matters within the department but I just want him to be absolutely assured that there is a commitment to engage with these reports within that eight-week window, which I would argue is both in letter and in spirit with what um, the late, great James Brockenshire said a few years ago. Some yeah. Peace spokesperson Alison Fulbus. I would like to thank David Neal for his work. Nobody can doubt that he was an independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, and his reports bear testament to this work. He called out the Home Office for being particularly poor at communication, for their data being excu inexcusably awful. In relation to border force, he highlighted basic stuff that is not being done. He shone, a sh uh, he shone a bright light in the shoddy treatment of unaccompanied children in hotels, some of whom are still missing to this day and the Home Office has not yet found. He highlighted the lack of grip and poor leadership that resulted in those children becoming lost. He highlighted also the chaos and the secret policies being operated as part of the Afghan citizen resettlement <coughs> scheme, utterly unacceptable. Can I ask the Minister what happens now to the planned inspections that are stuck in limbo, uh, inspections which include adults at risk, very crucial when you've had uh, people committing suicide at asylum accommodation, small boats, again all the more critical when we have the tragic loss of a seven-year-old wee girl uh, just this week, on high-performance visas, on Rwanda, on Georgia and on age assessment, what will happen to this work plan that the Chief Inspector set out, what will happen to the staff that are in place those expert inspectors in place to deliver that. Will he take on David Neal's recommendations for someone who would follow him in his post? Uh, and what will happen to, to this department and to the future reports? When will we, get, will we get a statement in the House rather being brought by a uh, UQ next time the reports are published? Here, here. So I'm, I'm very grateful to the shadow um, SNP spokesman for, for that variety of questions. And I, I think I too actually want to place on record my thanks to Mr Neil for the work that he did. I think, because I think it is perfectly, I mean there's chuntering from the benches opposite, but it is perfectly um, right and proper to thank him for the work that he did. There are recommendations that government has accepted and taking forward. We treat the outcome of those reports with the seriousness that it warrants. We will continue to work through those recommendations, even in the absence of an ICIBI. We will continue to make progress against the commitments that we have made. Obviously, we want to get on and appoint a replacement for Mr Neil. That process is underway. We want to do that as quickly as is possible, whilst also making sure that we properly engage the Home Affairs Select Committee in that process, and we will do so in the way that the committee would rightly expect. Um, on the issue of UAS hotels, I think it is welcome that we no longer have any UAS hotels under the auspices of the Home Office, but the recommendations that were made within the report still stand, and, we, and, we, and again, we treat seriously. As I said to an earlier Home Affairs Select Committee appearance, I treat with the utmost seriousness tracing missing asylum-seeking children, and we have managed to track down more of those children relative to the um, time when we met at the Home Affairs Select Committee with better relationships with the police around that, improved guidance and other steps. 
On Afghan arrivals, we continue to see Afghans coming across under the ACRS. That is welcome, and we will continue to evolve that scheme and make improvements where we can. We've made commitments around that scheme. That is an issue that is of real importance to me. That is a responsibility that I take incredibly seriously to fulfil our promises to those people of Afghanistan who worked with the British government and others. And, as I say, I want to make sure that we go about this recruitment process in the proper way, involving the Home Affairs Select Committee. There will be that engagement with the Secretariat at the ICIBI that the Second Permanent Secretary is leading, and we will get on and appoint a successor. I'd like to pay tribute to David Neil. It's fair to say when uh, we did the pre-appointment scrutiny of him uh, in the Home Affairs Committee, we did have doubts, but he's proved himself to be a diligent and dogged public servant in some of the most difficult circumstances. Um, notwithstanding the issue of him not being reappointed, the 13 reports that have been published raise significant issues, whether on uh, the borders at City Airport, Afghan resettlement, uh, child asylum seekers. Um, so what assurances can uh, the Minister give that, despite the fact these have only just been published, work has been undertaken on them? And can my uh, honourable friend, the Minister, also give me his thoughts on the excellent suggestion that this post should be made independent so the Chief Inspector can publish the reports when they're ready, rather than dropping them into the Home Office memory hole and hoping for the best? So it's fair to say, and again, my honourable friend is a diligent member of the Home Affairs Select Committee. It is fair to say that where recommendations are made, we engage with that constructively, and quite often progress will be made against those recommendations even in advance of reports being laid. And he can absolutely um, have assurance from me that we will continue to work through the commitments that we have made in responding to various recommendations that were made in those 13 reports and the future um, reports will be laid within that eight-week window, having made that promise to this House. In terms of the procedural um, element that he raises, um, I'm very happy to take that point away and raise that with ministerial colleagues with responsibility directly for the ICIBI relationship. Anne Abbott. As colleagues have said, the Home Affairs Select Committee found Mr Neil a very diligent and committed public servant. But I'd like to ask the Minister, does he share the Chief Inspector's concern about unaccompanied child migrants? Um, he reported on them playing very unsuitable games, trying to bet which one of them will be the first to go into foster care, their ages being overestimated. So you have children sharing bedrooms with much older adults. Does he propose to follow up on any of the issues with the Chief Inspector raised? The Right Honourable Lady um, should know that that is an area that we have been very concerned about. That, that issue of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children should never, ever be the subject of a game. And I think all of us were horrified to, to hear about that particular instance, which, um, following those inspections findings, the Department launched an immediate investigation into the inappropriate behaviour of the support worker, who was removed from site immediately and didn't return. As I've said, um, all seven hotels used to accommodate unaccompanied asylum-seeking children have since closed, but those are recommendations that we have treated seriously as a department, and I think that there is a lot of learning there for the future that we would want to be cognisant of as we take forward our work, but also the wider work that we do with local authorities in this area of safeguarding the most vulnerable children. Sir Julian. Yeah, um, may I welcome the Minister's earlier assurance about Afghans who fought or otherwise supported our troops against the Taliban. Can he explain, for the benefit of us not au fait with the details of this dispute, for what reason were these reports not published earlier? At what level was the decision not to publish taken? And had they been published sooner, do we think the um, inspector would be out of a job and thus looking for a replacement? The issue in relation to the termination of the inspector's 
um, appointment is obviously one that we've commented before in this House. He lost the confidence of the Home Secretary and there was information shared with the media that ought not to have been shared, which was confidential and that was outside of the appropriate publication process. When it comes to earlier decisions um, under previous ministers, I can't speak to that in terms of the publication of reports, but what I can speak to is the fact that I said very clearly on a number of occasions that we would get on and respond to these reports. That is precisely what we have done, but I'm also reassuring the House today, and I think this is important, and I think that the House is interested in this particular point, that we will respond to these reports within eight weeks, which arguably lives up in both letter and in spirit to the commitment that James Brockenshire made all those years ago when he was holding this role. Mr Carmichael. Thank you, Mr Speaker. These reports are cumulatively a quite remarkable catalogue of past failings, but can I invite the Minister to look ahead? He's referred already to the Rwanda scheme. Does he agree with me that the a incoming independent inspector must be allowed to examine the workings of the Rwanda scheme, and does he also agree that, in fact, the Rwanda scheme should not be implemented unless or until the next inspector has offered a satisfactory bill of health on it? It will, of course, be for the um, next inspector to decide on their programme of work, but what I can say is that I disagree with him on his latter point, I would argue that lives are at stake, that every day that people lose their lives in the Channel is one day too many. We are making progress and seeing through the commitments that we made in relation to putting an end to these Channel crossings, but the policy with Rwanda is absolutely front and centre in terms of being the next part of the jigsaw to put those evil criminal gangs out of business, and we shouldn't wait any longer than is absolutely necessary to get on and deliver on that work. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Rwanda policy has cost over half a billion, a proximus cost of two million per individual that they're seeking to transport over to Rwanda. Will the bill be ever implemented and is it good value for the taxpayer? Yeah. Good question. Um, so I, I sort of hear a lot of criticism there, but no constructive suggestion as to what he would do in the absence of the Rwanda policy. As I've said, we engage properly and thoroughly with the National Audit Office around those figures. We continue to be committed to providing transparency around those figures through the annual report and accounts. I would argue that the Rwanda policy is an important part of our answer to putting an end to these criminal gangs and the terrible criminality that they oversee. And crucially, this is about saving lives, and we will get on and deliver on that policy. And he will have the opportunity within the next few weeks, no doubt, to vote for that bill to help us to operationalise this policy and put those evil criminal gangs out of business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Borders Inspectorate found that staff working in a Home Office-run hotel made unaccompanied asylum-seeking children play a disgraceful guessing game to identify which would be the next child to be placed in foster care, a practice which is certain to cause more distress to children who are already traumatised. The same report found that agency workers employed to look after children as young as nine had insufficient background checks and training. What has the Minister done to ensure that he understands the full extent of the risks to children in the asylum system? And what steps is he taking to end such disgraceful practices and guarantee that everyone working with children is properly vetted and trained? Yeah. She's right to say that everybody working with children ought to be properly vetted. We have taken very seriously the recommendations that were made by Mr Neil in response to that issue. As I was able to um, say to the Right Honourable Lady, um, the member for Hackney, this was a terrible situation. There was accountability in relation to the individual who thought that it was appropriate to play that game, which I think to any member of this House and right-minded person is abhorrent. She's right to say that those children are already in very difficult circumstances, having been through an awful loss. And all of those individuals, and I use the word professionals, have a responsibility to them to care for them and to behave in a way that is appropriate and befitting to that role. And whilst there are no longer any 
um, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children hotels open under the Home Office's remit, I still think that there is value in those recommendations that should carry through into the work that we do with local authorities. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The independent anti-slavery commissioner, Dame Sarah Thornton, raised concerns about government policy on trafficking and slavery. Her contract wasn't renewed and that crucial post was vacant for 16 months. Now, David Neil, as the ICIBI has raised concerns about immigration, he was sacked and that post will be vacant for months. The minister has said that independent scrutiny plays an important role. But does he not agree that under this government, not only is independent scrutiny not valued, it's becoming a sackable offence? <laughs> I've been very clear with the House about the basis upon which Mr Neil's um, contract was terminated. I don't think that it was appropriate to share that confidential information in the way that he did that was outside, that was outside of the process for publication. But, as I've, as I've said repeatedly now, we do want to get on and appoint a successor. There is an important role here, there is an important remit that the Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration holds. The House sees value in that, the Government sees value in that. We are looking at what can be done to bridge the situation in the absence of a full-time permanent Chief Inspector, and no doubt we will say more once that work has been concluded. John Morrow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as Chair of the Old Party Parliamentary Group for Africa, I met with David Neil a number of times. He was incredibly impressive, robust, well-informed, all over the detail and entirely independent. Mm -hmm. It absolutely beggars belief that the government should have ignored his reports, because publication is essential for scrutiny, ignored his reports for so long, then sack him over teams and then dump all the reports out at once. Mm -hmm. So does the minister believe that the Home Office is so perfect, everything is going so well in the Home Office, that it should be above scrutiny? Or is it more the case that everything is going so badly on Miranda, on the asylum backlog, on our border security, that there is no hope of improvement until we have a change of government? Yeah. Well, it's uh, an interesting observation, but one that um, I'm afraid sits behind it, a lack of policy and a lack of alternative in terms of a credible approach to borders and immigration. On the specific point about um, Mr Neil, what he said in response to those reports being laid last week is that I think it's a real positive that these reports have been published. I think it bodes well that the Home Secretary has gripped his officials in getting these reports published so quickly. I agree with him. I promised that we would lay those reports. We've got on and done it, and we will um, table the outstanding reports within the eight-week window moving forward. Mr Speaker, last week's figures showed 46,000 people still in asylum hotels. David Neil's report said, and I quote, there is no evidence of a Home Office strategy to end hotel use as recommended by ICIBI in 2022. He's right, isn't he? Mr. I'm afraid what is right is that the Honourable Lady consistently votes against the strategy to end the use of hotels, as do her colleagues on the front bench and on the opposition back benches. The fact is that the way in which you address the issue of hotels is to diversify the accommodation offer for local authority areas to engage properly with dispersed accommodation, and I would encourage all members of this House to take an interest about the performance of their respective local authorities. Getting on top of this through larger sites like the ones that we have brought forward, but also crucially reducing the flow of people coming across the Channel, arriving in our country illegally. And every time, time and again, the opposition benches have the chance to do something about the flow of people yeah. arriving that undoubtedly leads to the very pressures that she touches on, they refuse to do so. I think that is where the scandal really lies. Andrew Gwynn. So is it the government's failure to tackle the asylum backlog, or is it his inability to grapple with the asylum hotel issue, or is it the staggering £2 million per person cost of the Rwanda deal to take one person out of this country 
the reason why he's broken the Home Office budget and he's coming cap in hand next week to Parliament to ask for an extra five and a half billion pounds of funding for the Home Office. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, that yet again this is another opposition member with no credible alternative to speak of, just lots of complaints about the work that the government is doing, and we are making progress. As I've said, the number of people arriving last year via the channel was down by a third compared to the year before. The population accommodated in hotels is going down. The number of hotels that are open is reducing. This government is making progress. We are living up to the commitments. He can keep parroting figures and chunter him from the back bench. But the fact is, what I'd rather him do is to come forward with a credible alternative plan. Perhaps then we can have a conversation. Tim Farrant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the shambles that is the ongoing mismanagement of our borders and the government's mismanagement of the asylum, huge asylum backlog, which has been just referred to, is now enhanced by an additional shambles of an unnecessary interregnum. Now, in answer to my right hon. Friend's question a moment ago, the Minister seemed to imply that independent oversight would not be necessary uh, in the next uh, few weeks and months whilst there is an interregnum uh, over the Rwanda uh, deal, the implication being that if the government is absolutely right, best case scenario from their perspective, 1% of all asylum seekers will go to Rwanda, but apparently that is so important that independent oversight is not necessary during this period. Will the Minister confirm that until a new inspector is formally and fully appointed in post, there will be no further progress on deporting anybody to Rwanda? Yeah, yeah. It is rather ironic, isn't it, that the honourable gentleman is arguing for due process on one hand and then saying that we should dispense with due process on the other. The fact is that the reason that the Chief Inspector of Borders contract was terminated was because of the issues that were not in accordance with the agreement around the post. That was not an acceptable situation. The Home Secretary lost confidence in him and that was why the steps were taken that were taken. But when it comes to oversight, I welcome oversight. I welcome accountability. There will be opportunities for scrutiny of the work in relation to Rwanda. The point that he um, seek to um, suggest that I had made, I was very clear in saying that we should not waste any time when lives are at risk in the channel. I think we shouldn't waste a moment in getting on and operationalising that Rwanda policy, but there will, of course, be plenty of opportunity for scrutiny of that work. Jim Mr Speaker, can I just put in record my thanks to the Minister for all his work that he did for one of my constituents last week and ensuring that one of the Ukrainian babies got back to Northern Ireland, and thank you for that. In relation to this question, bearing in mind the gap that is left in this vital component of our immigration response, and for example, the most recent difficulty in Northern Ireland with the absence of ministers in situ meant that senior civil servants had the ability to make decisions but were loath to do so, and those who did make decisions did not allow for the usual accountability and explanation of decisions. So, in relation to the role of civil servants and the importance to have the ministerial oversight, uh, oversight of all that, how will the minister, in relation to the independent chief inspector of borders and, and uh, immigration, ensure that this is not the case until a replacement is in place? Thank you. My, um, my honourable friend um, goes about his business in the House always diligently, and he speaks with um, great passion about Northern Ireland. I am really delighted that uh, we now have ministers back in government. I am looking forward to engaging with counterparts in um, Northern Ireland around these issues, and I just want him to be absolutely reassured that that um, engagement will be at the cornerstone of the work that we do. There is a commitment to engage thoroughly and extensively. And as I say, we want to get on and appoint an a replacement inspector. We think that this is an important role. We think it's an important role for everybody in the United Kingdom. Those, those functions that they oversee matter to everybody the length and breadth of this country. And we will make that appointment as soon as we're able. Point of order, Neil Hamby. Um, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to both your office and to the clerks uh, in preparing uh, for this point of order. On Friday, the 1st of March, during the Conversion Practices Bill debate, the member for Rutland and Melton spoke of the need for LGBT members and staff to feel safe coming to work in this place. In response to this, I asked the following. 
In fact, people in the LGB community are often referred to as bigots, transphobes and other slurs just because we have concerns about legislation such as this and want to make sure that young LGB people are protected and trans people. Does the Honourable Lady agree that the rule must apply to all sides of any debate, not just the side she favours? The Honourable Member responded with the following. The Honourable Gentleman is entirely right, but there was one letter missing in his LGB, the letter T. We do not divide the LGBT community in this place. Members can say that they have concerns about what we are doing, but by removing the T, the Honourable Gentleman is suggesting that transgender people do not exist. He is suggesting that they are less than other LGB people. And I will not stand for that because it was trans people who stood with gay people at Stonewall. It was trans people who fought alongside them for LGB rights. I will happily discuss the intricacies of legislation with the Honourable Gentleman, but when he chooses to eradicate, that is wrong. Later in the debate, she made the following comment about the UK's only gay rights charity. That includes the LGB Alliance, who have also removed the T. This raises the following serious concerns. Despite specifically mentioning the safety of trans people immediately prior to asking my question, the member launched into what felt like a targeted attack on my character. Furthermore, it felt like this was aggravated by my protected characteristics of same-sex attraction and gender-critical beliefs. In addition to this, the member, a heterosexual woman, felt it appropriate to lecture me, a homosexual male, on the boundaries under which she believes I should be permitted to exercise my rights and protections. Specifically, she demanded that this should centre the needs of the completely separate protected characteristic of gender reassignment, commonly known as forced teaming. Following this, the member then gave an inaccurate account of the Stonewall riots that has been corrected repeatedly by eyewitness testimony. As a direct consequence of this, various news outlets have wrongly accused me of dropping the tea and have ignored the context that a straight woman was lecturing a gay man about what rights he is permitted to use. Given the sensitivity of these matters, this is deeply concerning. I have had five years of abuse, including murderous threats, mainly from heterosexuals who claim to be allies, but they are allies of queer theory, not lesbians, gay men, bisexuals or transsexual people. This outburst felt deliberate and targeted, and I consider these behaviours as emblematic of the modern-day homophobia that has been insinuated into our culture by organisations such as Stonewall and Mermaids. In response to the video clip on social media, prominent transsexuals... Sorry, 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 just one... Just, you'll have to just... I hope the members are coming to an end very quickly. Thank you. I, I, I think, you, Mr Speaker, this is the, the text that was agreed with the clerks. Um, in response to the video clip on social media, prominent transsexual campaigner Dr Debbie Hayton said, we trans people value the right to organise separately from LGB and as trans people. My LGB friends need and deserve the same right to organise separately from us. We can still organise together when it serves, us both serves both groups. Nobody is lesser. In a statement issued by the Gay Men's Network, they noted that the member for Rutland and Merton's comments were not characteristic of an otherwise civilised debate. We urge her to reflect on these comments and consider apologising. I agree. At the very least, the member should apologise, not just to me, but to others who may feel threatened by her remarks. Any further consideration will be contingent on this. After the debate, two members, the member for Jarrow and the member for Nottingham East, both gave inaccurate accounts of the outcome of the day's debate, laying blame for its failure at the doors of opponents. Uh, the truth is that the bill failed to garner sufficient support in the closure motion called by the member for Brighton Kemp Town. Again, in the sensitive policy area, this shows a lack of concern for the safety of all members and risks whipping up targeted harassment. These posts should be removed and the members should apologise. Thank you. Can, can I just say I'm very disappointed that clerks have agreed such a long text. It is an important issue and it's quite right that the member raises the issue and is concerned. 
but I am concerned about the length of time that that has taken, and therefore I hope that I will be speaking with the clerks as well. Can I first of all say I am grateful to the Honourable Member for his point of order and for giving notice of it. I hope he has notified Honourable Members that he intended to refer to them in the Chamber. Honourable Members are responsible for the content of their own speeches, provided that they remain within the House Rules of Order. I understand the strength of the Honourable Member's feeling, but the Chair heard nothing disorderly in the remarks made by the Honourable Member for Rutland and Melton on Friday. He is correct in his observation that the Conversion Practices Bill did not make further progress because fewer than 100 members voted for the closure. But it is also true that the House continued to debate the bill until the moment of interruption, which is unusual through members are entirely within their rights to do so. I thank the member for being noted. Right. We, we now come to the general debate on farming. I call the Minister Faye Jones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am delighted to open this debate on behalf of the Government. But I am incredibly proud this afternoon to speak on behalf of the many thousands of farmers that I represent. Now, honourable and right honourable members may be confused as to why I am opening this afternoon's debate. But it is precisely because this Government believes in the importance of our union and the industries which sustain it that I am here this afternoon. This Government understands that farming drives rural Britain. It generates jobs and growth in rural areas. My constituency of Brecon and Radlershire is home to proud beef, sheep and poultry farmers. 365 days a year, they produce world-class food, which is good for our health, good for our economy and good for our environment. That brings me on to the key reason why I am here today. A fortnight ago, the Prime Minister told the National Farmers Union Conference that we, the Conservative Party, will always have your back. And to farmers across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, I give that commitment again. Farming has unique potential to address the world's biggest challenges feeding a growing world, reducing emissions and restoring nature. These huge tasks have been complicated by the recent reality of volatile global prices, as well as changes in weather patterns and climate. But to address the long term, it is the immediate challenges which need to be dealt with, and this Government has been working to tackle one of the biggest drain on on farm incomes. Inflation is down from 11% last year to 4% now. Beyond these immediate challenges, we have a plan for supporting British farming, bolstered by the Prime Minister's announcements a fortnight ago. The plan to back our farmers has three elements. Firstly, we are investing in farmers. Our commitment to farming is absolutely solid, and every penny of England's £2.4 billion annual farming budget will be spent on farmers across this Parliament. In England, we are stepping away from the bureaucratic and dysfunctional common agricultural policy. Instead, our new system focuses on long-term food security by supporting and investing in the essential foundations, from healthy soils to clean water. Our plan is starting to pay off as nearly half of all farmers are now in one of our schemes in England. January 2024 brought about the biggest upgrade to farming schemes since Brexit gave us the opportunity to design our own agricultural support. And a fortnight ago, the Prime Minister went further still to support farmers. He announced our biggest ever package of grants, expected to total £427 million in 2024. I will. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. I, I recently visited Andrew Gilman at Statfold Farm. He's got a biomass boiler, he's got some solar panels on the roofs, and he's even got a wind turbine. But what he wants from the government is support in mechanising the milking process. He wants some robots. Is that the type of thing the government would support? I congratulate my honourable friend on raising that point and congratulate Andrew for his innovation. That's exactly the type of thing this government wants, support, wants to support. And that's why we've announced the biggest ever package of funding, as I say, around £427 million. Pounds. I give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm extremely grateful to the uh, uh, Minister for giving way and I look forward to debating with her tomorrow in Westminster Hall. I do think the government has left itself open to the accusation that it's neglected the interests of farmers when it comes to the trade deals assigned post-Brexit. 
What assurance is can she give the House that in future trade deals that interests of farmers will be at the top of the pile? Thank the honourable gentleman for that intervention. I wouldn't want to give away all my best lines ahead of tomorrow's debate, and I look forward to seeing him in Westminster Hall. But let me say to him, I do not agree with his assessments on the trade deals that this government has been able to strike outside of the European Union. They represent real opportunities for farmers right across England and Wales, and he would do well to support them. As I say, I, I'll take the honourable gentleman's intervention. Minister, very much for, for her uh, commitment to the whole of farming across the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It's really important for us in Northern Ireland, very important for my constituency of Strangford. The Honourable Lady has outlined the importance. Will the Minister give some commitment to working with the regional administrations in Northern Ireland Assembly, up and running with a new Minister in place to ensure that we can work, work forward together within this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Because together we can do great things. The Honourable Gentleman is entirely right, and I certainly am committed to working with ministers from across all the devolved administrations in the United Kingdom from my role in the Wales office, and I know that DEFRA ministers are as well, so I can give him that commitment. But on innovation, we have a grants package upgrade which will make a concrete difference to British farms, for example, bolstering the Improving Farming Productivity Fund, which will allow farmers like Andrew, raised by my honourable friend, to invest in robotic equipment and barn top solar. Secondly, we are changing our approach and building a culture that is based on trust. <coughs> Farmers have asked for a fairer, more supportive regula regulatory system. So in England, we have reformed our approach and have already cut penalties for minor issues by 40%. We have ended the harsh EU cross-compliance system to instead choose a fairer and more preventative approach to regulation because no one cares more about the land or being able to pass on a healthy farm to future generations more than farmers themselves. Oh, I will give way, yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to the, to the Minister. Um, it, it's, more, it's more than just passing on a farm. It's producing food for the nation, and we're proud that our farmers do that. Can she confirm to me that this government will always back farmers as food producers yeah, yeah. rather than wildflower yeah, yeah, growers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think my honourable friend hits the nail on the head. It is a combination of the two that we are looking to deliver, certainly in England. As I say, farmers deserve this trust, so we have now announced that we will be delivering on our promise to cut the planning red tape that is stopping <laughs> farmers from diversifying. In April, we will lay legislation so that farmers can create bigger farm shops, commercial space and outdoor sports venues. Similarly, farmers have raised the often unfair pricing they receive for their products. So a fortnight ago, I'll just make some progress. So a fortnight ago, we laid new regulations for the dairy sector and we're launching a review of the poultry sector. We will bring forward similar regulations for the pig sector later this year, with regulations for the egg sector to follow. I give way to the honourable gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hear what the Minister is saying, make a very powerful point, but I'd just like to make the point about Exmoor. We have a national park who stops everything happening. We need to get the national parks under control. They will not allow farm shops, they will not allow development. When you're a sheep farmer on Exmoor, you have enough trouble as it is without being told you can't do holiday cottages, you can't set up farm shops, and you're not allowed to go for planning. Could we please make exception for the national parks so they can join the real world? I thank the honourable gentleman for um, that intervention. Living in a national park as well in Mid Wales, I understand his frustrations entirely. Of course, that will be a matter uh, for DLUC and DEFRA ministers, but I know the minister will have heard his point. As, as well as the regulations, uh, I will give way. Yes. Great. The minister, strong supporter of the Secretary of State and Prime <laughs> Minister's recent initiatives to make food growing far more important. What are the targets now for getting much more self-sufficient in food, and won't it need further reorientation of the money away from Elms and Wilding to proper food promotion schemes? My right, my right honourable friend preempts me, and I will certainly be coming on to talk about that point in, in just a few moments. But I do want to talk about further reforms that the government is introducing, particularly in the field of farming mental health. We will be making up to £500,000 available to charities to deliver projects that support mental health in the farming sector. This is to build on the support already on offer through our Farming Resilience Fund, which has benefited over 19,000 farmers to date. 
Mental health in agriculture is a key concern for the department, so much so that the Farming Minister, my right honourable friend, regrets he is unable to be with us at present as he is hosting a round table on mental health in agriculture. And I know shadow ministers will agree that is a commendable thing to be doing. Altogether, this work to change our approach is to build a better and more supportive system around farmers so that they can get on and do what only they do best. And before I talk about our final strand of work, I want to congratulate my honourable friend for Bosworth. Today, his campaign for online retailers to carry a specific Buy British button has achieved another success, as Ocado has become the latest retailer to adopt the tool, joining Morrisons, Aldi and Sainsbury's, and I congratulate him for his campaign. Mr Deputy Speaker, food security is a vital part of our national security. The primary role of farmers is to produce the nation's food, and they deserve our gratitude for that. A point echoed to me on many occasions by the chairman of the EFRA Select Committee, who is away on a Select Committee visit and unable to join the debate today. Recent years have brought home the truth of that, particularly in an age of climate change and instability and increasingly volatile global food production. Uncertain times require us to double down on the certainty of our food system. In the government's food strategy, we set a clear commitment to at least maintain domestic food production at the current level, which is around 60% of what we consume. The importance of food security is why we brought in the three times a year food security report going through the, through the Agriculture Act 2010, 2020. Going further, the Prime Minister announced a fortnight ago that we will be significantly strengthening this work given the context of the last three years through a new annual food security index. Climate change is increasingly likely to impact the sector with more extreme weather events, so it's only right that we step up our monitoring of food security to, to ensure that we can act swiftly and decisively against any in-year shocks. And we expect this work to be UK-wide, and we will work to achieve this, strengthening accountability across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Would my honourable friend be I will. How does the... How does the emphasis about which she's now talking square with the SFI activities, which arouse considerable concern in the farming community that it would almost be better and more paying proposition for them to give up farming altogether under the SFI scheme? Isn't my friend who spoke, who intervened a while ago, right that what we have to do through the SFI is start to consider how we encourage people to produce food and not not to produce it? Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to emphasise and underline the importance of food production. DEFRA is actively monitoring uh, the take-up of SFI schemes with food production in mind. So he raises a key concern that the department is, I believe, already addressing. And going further, last year the Prime Minister hosted the UK's first Farm to Fork Summit at Downing Street for the first time, putting industry leaders at the sharp end of policy making. We will be making this an annual occasion, and this year's summit will consider the publication of the first Food Security Index. And finally, millions of tonnes of perfectly good farm food are wasted each year, thrown away simply because of shape or size. It is unfortunate that this is still the case even in 2024, so we have also announced that we are bringing in a £15 million fund to redirect the huge amount of surplus food to those in need. This £15 million will be available directly to farmers or the redistribution sector working with farmers. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, boosting and strengthening our food security is paramount. And this act, I'm going to make some progress, if I may. And this action stands in stark contrast to those of the party opposite. Now, farmers in Wales have become used to an uneasy relationship with Welsh labour over the last 25 years. But as members may have seen, frustration is turning to anger following the publication of the Welsh Government's Sustainable Farming Scheme. This scheme is nothing short of unworkable. Instead of freeing farmers from the burden of red tape, farmers are forced into an atrocious set of data gathering and reporting on a yearly basis. Farmers will be support forced to submit data on the amount of medicines they give their animals or the rates of lamb loss in their flock, soil samples and even data on worm numbers and seed receipts. It will re require every farmer to do six online training courses each and every year. And most controversially of all, it forces farmers to take 10% of their land out of production to plant trees, 
harming our ability to feed ourselves. Mr Deputy Speaker, last week a number of farmers travelled to Cardiff Bay to protest against these changes. These protesters were not extremists or conspiracy theorists, as Labour MPs last week labelled them. They were raising legitimate grievances about the viability of their businesses under the Welsh Government's plans. Now, colleagues in England will know that this Government has taken decisive action to tackle bovine TB. In 2013, under the Coalition Government, a badger cull was introduced in England to tackle the appalling rates of bovine TB in cattle. Now, those of us who represent beef or dairy farmers know the pain of bovine TB. It is one of the most difficult and intractable animal health challenges the livestock sector faces today. Tens of thousands of cattle are culled each year after testing positive for the disease. This has a devastating personal impact on livestock owners and their family. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, here I must declare an interest. In 2013, when working for the National Farmers Union, I volunteered to work on the pilot badger cull in Somerset. We worked 12-hour shifts in a porter cabin in a secret location as anti-cull saboteurs would follow us home at night. That pilot resulted in a 37% reduction in bovine TB breakdowns. Across the way in Gloucestershire, we delivered a 66% reduction. That shows that culling works. No country... I will give way, of course. I'm very grateful for giving way. Our farmers in my constituency in Gloucestershire have been involved in the cull probably longer than anybody else, except perhaps the Somerset levels. Could my right honourable, my honourable friend give them an assurance today that we will not introduce measures which restrict culling and their after effects until we have a realistic vaccine programme in place that actually is seen to work? My right honourable friend is, of course, right. This is part of a three-pronged approach that DEFRA is planning to take, and we will continue to be led by the science. As I say, no country in the world has ever been able to grip the scourge of bovine TB without tackling the disease in the wildlife. The science is clear. The tide is turning on bovine TB in England, and a major element of this success has been the industry-led cull of badgers in affected areas. Yes, briefly, of course. Thank you so much. My honourable friend was right. Somerset started this, and the intimidation was appalling at the time, as you're well aware to myself and many, many others, but we weathered it. I would urge the Minister and members across this House, it worked because farmers led it. Farmers were absolutely determined to do it. Having survived the foot and mouth as I became MP, and then go into TB, farmers are responsible. They understand the countryside. They understand what they're doing. And I would urge all members of this House where TB and other things are concerned, please give the farmers the benefit of the doubt. They look after the land, they manage it well. I couldn't have put it better myself, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, culling, as I say, is part of a three-pronged approach that DEFRA has taken to tackle bovine TB and field trials for a new cattle vaccine and companion skin test for bovine TB started in 2021 and remain ongoing. Mr Deputy Speaker, if the Welsh Government had any ambition for farming in Wales, they would have the backbone of this Government and introduce a cull in Wales. Yeah. But their weakness in the face of this issue is causing alarm and panic in the Welsh livestock sector. Instead of a cull, they have a First Minister who told them it was their fault. Labour's Mark Drakeford told the Senedd that the disease spreads when farmers import, import infected cattle despite farmers working desperately hard to maintain good biosecurity measures. But this is a First Minister who thinks that farmers are also entirely responsible for poor water quality. The All Wales Nitrate Vulnerable Zone, introduced in 2021, is an unworkable piece of legislation which has done nothing to improve our rivers. Instead, it forces farmers to farm to a calendar, only spreading muck during certain dates, never mind the weather. Mr Deputy Speaker, NVZ, Bovine TB, the Sustainable Farming Scheme, all examples of an ill-thought-out policy from a government determined to set its face against farming in Wales. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in contrast, the record of the UK Conservative Government is clear. Our plan is to invest in farmers, change our approach and protect food security. Yeah. Meeting farmers face-to-face -face in North Wales a fortnight ago, the Prime Minister again made clear 
that we have got your back. This Government will always support and be proud of British farming, yeah. and I commend this debate yeah. to the House. Yeah. Opposition front bench, please. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to start by congratulating Tom Bradshaw uh, on his election as President of the National Farmers yeah. Union. He will do a fantastic job, I'm sure, and I wish him all the best as he starts in his new role standing up for our British farmers. He has big Wellington boots to fill, of course, after the outstanding job yeah. that Minette Batters did over the past decade, and I'm sure the whole House wishes her the very best in her future endeavours. Mm. Now, re recent years have been very challenging for farmers. The Covid pandemic, the government's botched EU withdrawal deal, Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine and war now in the Middle East. Each of these shocks has underscored how vulnerable our food supply chain really is and how dependent we are on our great British farmers. Food security is national security. British consumers have in recent years seen empty shelves in local supermarkets, while food prices rocketed by 19% uh, at their peak last year. We need to get resilience back into the system, and at the heart of that must be a commitment to back our British farmers. I had the pleasure of attending the NFU conference in Birmingham last month and the Oxford Farming Conference in January. Speaker after speaker made clear that British farming is in crisis and farmers feel abandoned by this government. Over 6,000 British producers have gone bust since 2017, and the agricultural workforce is one-third smaller in the same time period. Labour shortages mean valuable crops have been left in the ground yeah. to rot. Yeah. The RABI Farmers Mental Health Charity reports alarmingly that suicide rates among farmers are now the highest of any sector in the UK economy, thanks to the huge pressures farmers are now under. This is heartbreaking, yep. and it should concern every single one of us. And since the Minister is unable to be here today, I'm glad that he is focusing with stakeholders uh, on an issue, uh, issue of that importance and that magnitude. Mm -hmm. Now, flooding was among the top issues raised at the NFU conference. Farmers have faced one of the wettest six-month periods on record, with many winter crops still not planted and others washed away or underwater. Farmers need better flood defences. It's astonishing that so much of the allocated funding has still not been spent over the past two years. I visited Retford in Nottinghamshire and I was astonished to learn that of the £11.7 million allocated for flood defences over the past two years, less than half of 1% had actually been spent. There is a severe failure of coordination between central government and the agencies responsible for getting spades in the ground to dig out the drainage systems, build the flood barriers and plant trees upstream that can help the land hold more water. I give way to the honourable gentleman. Much indeed. The Shadow Minister is making some interesting points, but I would say that I've had probably more flooding than anybody in this house with the levels. One of the biggest challenges we face is the intransigence of the Environment Agency and Natural England. They are quite impossible. The, the Honourable Member is making his powerful points, but one of the reasons we're finding it difficult to build up the defences, difficult to clear out the reams, ditches, difficult to maintain in the Kleist, the dams, is because they will not give way on making every single thing impossible. I have been waiting for a barrage in Bridgewater since 2014. We really must break this logjam. And if I would say gently to the Shadow Minister, please, if you can help do it, we're all on your side. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. And he makes a very important uh, point about the experience of flooding in his part of the country, which is sadly reflected in other parts of the country as well. And I do, I do think government whoever might be leading it, needs to get a grip uh, of these agencies and work more closely with them, which is why um, Labour has proposed, if we are in, uh, elected into government, to introduce a flood resilience task force to bring together national and local government and the frontline agencies that he uh, referred to to make sure that funding once allocated is actually spent. 
to protect our farmland and rural communities from the very devastating impact of flooding. Now, just referring to the, um, the agencies he was referring to, would it not be a better idea to scrap them all together and to hand responsibility back to government ministers where they originally were? Because the agencies who are now employed to do this are often doing things <coughs> completely against government policy and in particular against farmers. Well, I, th I think the answer, and it's a quicker answer than playing around with the architecture of uh, agencies and national government, is for the national government to get a grip. Uh, the, these agencies are responsible to national government, uh, and I'd like to see much stronger command from national government to make sure those agencies do what those ag agencies were set up to do and what they are funded to do, but which they are clearly not doing uh, to anything like the extent or the quality that members of this House on all sides expect them, expect them to do. Now, a second point uh, I want to raise, P Vladimir Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, which has sent energy prices rocketing. This exposed the government's failure tra to transition to cheaper, homegrown energy, and as a result, soaring energy bills have clobbered British farmers yeah. and British producers. Yeah. Labour's approach would be very different. We will switch on GB Energy to yeah, cut yeah. bills for farmers, households and businesses. This publicly owned company will direct public and private investment to harness the power of wind, wave, solar and nuclear energy to cut bills, create jobs and secure energy supply chains inside our own country, freeing us from dependence on foreign dictators like Putin. We can also help farmers who want to generate clean energy on their own land. Under this government, it can take up to 10 years to get planning permission to connect this desperately needed energy into the national grid. Yeah. Labour will reform our planning laws and cut this weight from years to just months. The government's bungled transition from EU farming payments has been another source of financial misery for farmers. Yeah. Far too many have seen incomes plummet as BPS is phased out. Tenant farmers in particular feel the new scheme doesn't work for them. The principles behind ELMS make sense, but the implementation has been chaotic and it's been bureaucratic. Instead of tackling the weaknesses in ELMS, the government have instead shuffled their feet and tried to claim the credit for reallocating a £220 million underspend. Well, that money should have been given to farmers in the first place and not returned to the Treasury. But at core, the government's failure is to have never developed a clear strategy for land use, including food production. Our land management scheme should support moves towards regenerative farming and nature recovery alongside food production. But instead of doing this, the Conservatives are increasingly positioning themselves against nature. Their attempt to trash environmental standards, to legalise the further pollution of already polluted rivers and waterways, was shocking. Yep. We have a limited amount of land for the size of our population in this country. We need a land use framework yep. to make sure the many competing demands on our land can work in balance. This government has failed to produce one. In government, Labour will introduce one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Conservative government stubbornly refuses to publish interim data showing what impact Elms is having. Yeah. The Guardian newspapers used a freedom of information request to expose how the government buried an analysis of the dire financial prospects for upland farmers after they realised it was in almost entirely bad news. Now, we need to know what's going wrong with ELMS so we can make it work more effectively. Yep. If this government won't publish that information, then an incoming Labour government will yeah, if we win yeah. the next general election. We have to make sure policy works for food production, as honourable members are, have already said in this debate, as well as for nature. And that means being open and transparent about what's really going on. Farmers are furious about the Conservative government's post-Brexit trade deals. Yeah. The outgoing NFU president, I see the minister shakes her head, but the outgoing NFU president, 
not a member or supporter of this party, called the government's approach, and I quote, morally bankrupt. Mm. Morally bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. The right honourable member for North East Somerset, until recently a senior member of the Cabinet, has called for the imp import of hormone-injected beef and chlorine-washed yeah, chicken. Exactly. That's not just alarming for British consumers, it would be catastrophic for British farmers. Yeah. We can't demand high welfare and environmental standards from our British producers if the government then undercuts them with yeah. lower quality imports. Yeah, 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 Yet yeah. that is the approach this Conservative government has taken. The government's own assessments say the Australia-New Zealand trade deal will result in the loss of £48 million from British agriculture and fisheries. No wonder the former Environment Secretary, the right honourable member for Camborne and Red Roof, attacked it as, in his words, not a good deal for the UK because, as he rightly said, it gave away far too much for far too little in return. Yeah, yeah. I give way to the honourable gentleman. On I'm grateful to give away, and I am indeed very critical, obviously, of what was done with the Australia trade deal. But will you at least, since he's raising this issue, give credit to the current government and the current Prime Minister for the steadfast approach they've taken, for instance, on deals with Canada and the CPTPP? It does seem a bit late, doesn't it, to have done a deal of, of the nature that you know, the, 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 the right honourable gentleman uh, attacked. It seems to depend which of the five families happens to be in charge of the Conservative Party at any one time as to what they're going to do on uh, agriculture policy, trade policy or any other policy. It's a rudderless government, but it always seems to be British farmers and producers who are on the losing end uh, of whatever deals that they, yeah, that they come yeah. up with. And in fact, the government's broken promises on trade go back much further uh, than, than the deal the Right Honourable Gentleman um, criticised. They promised farmers uh, that they would keep full access to the European markets for their high quality British produce after Brexit. But then the government threw up trade barriers that blocked them from exporting. Labour's way forward is to seek a renegotiated veterinary agreement with the EU. We must cut through Tory red tape at our borders yep. to get British food exports moving again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our country spends over a billion pounds a year buying food for hospitals and prisons. Labour will make sure at least half of that food is locally produced or certified to higher environmental standards. That would put money straight into the pockets of British farmers and British producers at a time when so many of them are struggling just to stay in business. We will devolve more decision-making to the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. That will give them more control over the skills and training to increase and upskill the farming yes. workforce, yeah. and more control over infrastructure investment so we can extend broadband in rural areas and extend the use of new technology in farming to boost productivity. Labour is offering a new deal for farmers. Lower bills from har harnessing the power of clean energy generated in our own country. More money in farmers' pockets by prioritising locally grown and sustainable food for public procurement and making sure Elms works effectively. Seeking a veterinary agreement with the EU to tear down the Tory barriers to trade. A flood resilience task force to protect farmland from devastating floods and planning reform yes. to help farmers diversify and plug their clean energy into the national grid. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, farmers do an extraordinary job as producers of, our, producers of our food and stewards of our land, yeah. yet they've been betrayed by this Conservative government. Yeah. British yeah. farmers deserve better. They deserve our thanks, our respect and our support. We are proud of our farmers, proud of the work they do to feed our nation and steward our beautiful countryside, but they need a government that's on their side to help them in this vital work. After 14 years of Conservative failure, only Labour can give farmers their future yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Order. Order. Uh, just in case anybody's in any doubt, the question is, as I should have said earlier, on the order paper. Sir Bill Wigan. Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member from Croydon North, although I suspect he has more customers in his constituency or consumers than he has farmers. I have 1,715 of probably the best farmers in the world in North Herefordshire, and it is a pleasure. Oh, no, there's no doubt about it. You see, 
The joy of my constituency is that in Herefordshire we grow every crop that the UK produces. No other county can make that claim. Whether it's raspberries, which come from Scotland usually, or hops from Kent, we do it all. And as a result, I've had to spend an awful lot of time with a variety of highly expert and very skilful farmers having their particular element of the industry explained. And I did agree with all the speakers so far when they say how important farmers are, but their troubles don't seem to be. And the worst case, of course, is bovine tuberculosis, and it's been 10 years yeah. since the Badger Cull began to tackle the transmission of TB, and it has been an enormous success. It plagued the agricultural sector, and in 2020, as many as 30,000 cattle were dying each year because of this terrible disease. I lost my bull uh, to it, so I know how devastating this can be for farmers across the country. Thanks to the culling of sick badgers, which carry the disease to cattle, 24% fewer cattle were killed in 22-23, relative to the preceding year. In fact, the number of deaths was the lowest it has been since 2008. And of course, the beneficiary of this is not just the farmers and their cows, but it is the healthy badger population who are therefore less likely to be exposed to this fatal disease. And with this rate of success, I fear the government's move away from culling badgers to a vaccination programme is premature and potentially disastrous. And a reactive cull just won't work because once DEFRA have decided that there's TB in the badger population, all your cows are dead. So it doesn't work, it's not good enough, it won't cut the mustard, and the department needs to rethink very carefully about what will happen because we have seen a 54% reduction in this disease. And we've learnt from COVID that you don't take away the precautions that are working before you're ready to bring in the new uh, DIVA test, the test to detect infected amongst vaccinated animals. That test allows the BCG test uh, vaccine to be applied to cattle and for the cattle that are vaccinated to be separated from the cattle that are infected. But until that test is ready, and a written answer to when that might be was 2027. Until that is brought in, we cannot take our, our, uh, our foot off the uh, culling programme. We cannot allow our defences to drop, and we cannot uh, let a 54% increase in TB which is what will happen if we continue to do the wrong thing, which I think the government is doing. So we need to protect the healthy badger population, the healthy cattle population, but most of all, it is a disease that reaches human beings too. And because of uh, resistance to penicillin and um, antimicrobial resistance, there aren't that many drugs that tackle tuberculosis. And if we, have, uh, if we allow this disease back, the risk to human health is a very serious one, particularly as there is now uh, an increasing desire to buy green top milk, which is unpasteurised. Um, considering that TB is a serious disease, consumption, as it used to be called, that is extremely dangerous. Um, it costs around £14,000 when a bovine TB breakdown takes place. It costs the taxpayer up to a billion pounds over the next 10 years. And, of course, I, I've already mentioned the risk to human health. So I, I would very much urge the government to think again about its reticence on allowing the cull to continue until the DIVA test is proven and active and working and successful, which I'm sure it will be. This was stressed when uh, the Honourable Member for Sherwood visited my constituency because it just breaks people's hearts when their cows are taken away but it's wrong that their health is threatened. And worst of all, the healthy badger population will be diminished as the disease spreads. Now, the rural economy is brewing with £43 billion worth of economic potential. And we need to cut back on the regulations and procedures that burden the sector. Farmers can spend over 15 hours a week on administrative work and a recent survey found that 86% of respondents believed that the levels of farming administration has actually increased. And I agree with that. I filled out my SFI form and my countryside stewardship forms 
and they are extremely complicated. But worse than that, they don't allow you to change them very often. So you can only put in a form once a year. Now that's fine if you're not going to change anything, but this is a dynamic industry and as a result we need to be much more flexible. A DEFRA tracker found that when accounting for regulatory and payment changes, over 50% of farmers have a negative view of their farming future. And uh, the transition from the basic payment scheme to the sustainable farming incentive is riddled with problems. Even though the new scheme is supposed to add flexibility to the system, farmers need to wait that year to amend their applications. And I think fundamentally the problem is that we have moved from a scheme where you were given money for the land you owned, which you considered your income. Now you have to fill out the SFI uh, form and agree to do things that are not in your interest. Every single uh, rule has a disadvantage to it, which is why we have to pay farmers to do it. But the problem is that when you balance your income as was under the basic payment scheme with your income as it's going to be under SFI, it will be lower. And as a result, farmers are extremely unhappy and put upon by that. And that is one of the reasons why the underspend by DEFRA is more complicated than the Honourable Gentleman, although he was right to touch upon it, it's much worse because 200 million every year not reaching the people that we are subsidising to provide us with food security is a proper problem for our country. This money isn't there to make sure that we don't compete with the French, it's meant to make sure that we can. So we really do need to make sure that we're not funding public money for public goods alone, we're also making sure that the people who are doing the work, that their incomes are maintained. So it's not just about the good of the industry, the good of nature, but it's also about making sure that the people who are doing the work are getting paid for it. And that is seriously wrong. I get a, a text message now from AFA, the Animal and Plant Health Agency, telling me about blue tongue. That seems to be going on all the time. But I'm not getting messages saying when the vaccine for it is going to appear. We need to be much more supportive of our farmers in every sector that they're dealing with because there are so many issues that they confront. Not least the consumer market. And it, a recent report found that the retail share that farmers receive is down to 0.03%. Now, some farmers have decided not to grow carrots anymore because the margins are so small. And according to research from the University of London, Portsmouth University and Sustain, a kilo of carrots priced at 45p costs growers 14 pence to grow, yet they only make a negligible profit. Beef farmers see a profit of only 0.03% on the price of a £3.50 pack of beef burgers, even though each pack costs them 90 pence to make. And dairy farmers uh, will only make a 0.02% profit for each £2.50 pack of mild cheddar, despite them costing it £1.48 to make. These margins are far too small, and competing with foreign counterparts is a, a secondary challenge, particularly for poultry farmers, who have to compete with imported chicken. Now, some may be treated with antibiotics, but the real problem for poultry farmers is the square footage that they are limited to produce on. Now, the one thing most people don't know about chickens is how long they live for. So a chicken will be probably 36 days old when it goes to be processed, 31 to 36 days. So the square footage that chicken's living in is a fairly dynamic thing. It's changing as the chicken gets bigger, which it does extremely quickly. And because the Americans allow the use of chlorine washing, those American chickens can be squished into a smaller square footage than, than British ones. That's not much good for the chicken. It's much better for the farmer. And the chlorine washing hides the risk to the consumer of salmonella and uh, E. coli and various other chicken transmitted diseases. So lower animal welfare, uh, it's, it's bad for the farmers uh, in the UK, and we haven't squared the circle. I'm sorry if I haven't explained it well enough, but a, 
a poultry lesson is always available for anybody who wants to go through it. But at the end of the day, we insist on much higher animal welfare standards, and as a result, our farmers are suffering, and they're being outcompeted by countries who are less scrupulous than we are. And therefore, the most important thing the government can do is make sure there is honesty in food labelling, yeah. so that we, the customers, whether they live in Croydon North or in Lempster, can go out and buy chicken that's been properly brought up, properly raised, properly looked after, and kept clean. So food labelling, please, please, this is really, really important. And particularly when you have things like uh, pasture-fed. Pasture-fed should mean the animal has been fed pasture its entire life, not for the last six months. And the benefit of that is that you, as the customer, when you eat it, will have far better ratios of omega-3 fatty acids to omega-6 fatty acids. And your omega-3 fatty acids are what your body uses to make cancer-fighting gamma-linoleic acid. So you need to know what you're buying. It's good for your health. So we all talk about a food strategy for the UK, but what we should really be doing is talking about a health strategy so that we feed our people not just the best food in the world produced to the highest standards, but the best food for them so that we don't have an obesity problem, we don't say, spend so much money on our health service, and we give our people what they really want, which is a happy, healthy and long life. That is my most powerful plea. But things are not so bad. If you look at what's been going on in France, uh, we, show, we saw their dissatisfaction with the increasing amount of red tape and greater competition from imports by them descending on Paris to disrupt a food distribution hub which feeds 12 million people. The Belgian farmers blockaded the EU building in Brussels in February. Water cannons were used, and in, in 2022, a Dutch farmer was shot at in Holland. And fortunately, the bullet just missed him during the protests there. The French government's response to these protests was to lower environmental regulations. That's got to be wrong in every direction. The farmers shouldn't be rioting, and the government shouldn't be lowering environmental standards. And we have not done that in this country. We have not got revolting farmers. In fact, mine are anything but. And as a result, we should be looking at our withdrawal from the common agricultural policy as one of the great successes of Brexit. And the government must do more to help farmers by producing local uh, produce. And the Buy British button, the campaign which uh, encourages supermarkets to, uh, to, to sell British products should be encouraged. But the one tragedy of public uh, procurement is that I don't think our armed forces get enough British beef and lamb. And, uh, of course, supporting uh, British food in schools and hospitals would boost local farmers. Um, but it's very difficult to still get local food from a local abattoir because thanks to the veterinary regulations. There aren't very many local abattoirs. There are some very big ones in Wales, but there are essentially only three major companies that, uh, that, are, that are slaughtering in, in any sort of capacity. And as a result, um, we need to make sure that we look at the regulations that hold local abattoirs back. And most of that is from veterinary inspection. Now, the problem with veterinary inspectors is that they need to be there when the animal is opened up because it smells different if it's not right inside. So the idea that we could have video vets watching what's going on doesn't work as well as I wish it did. So the, we need to go back a step to local abattoirs, making them competitive and having a more... Uh, yes, of course, I'll give way. Of course. I, I thank um, the right honourable member for giving way. Uh, on, on the point that he makes on abattoirs, who Phillips Butchers in my constituency has just closed its abattoir and it's such an absolute disaster because the salt marsh lamb in Goa was being slaughtered there. But the lack of support for abattoirs, now it has to and, and the ability of butchers to be able to keep to train their staff because it's a very skilled job and also to be able to keep their license, even if they have to short close for short periods of time, is a huge cost to the butchers. And we're going to see more more and more abattoirs close as a result of this. Does he agree with me that this is a disaster? I definitely agree it's a disaster. I definitely agree that it is the cost that the abattoir owner was having to find 
per capita of, of animals killed that would have put him out of business. It happened in my constituency as well. And, and one of the biggest problems is that the burden is too high. Now, of course, when we're buying Gower uh, lamb or Hereford beef or any of the wonderful things that are killed and processed locally, by not having the abattoir, those animals have to travel considerably further, so there's an animal welfare problem. There's a human health risk if we don't have proper inspections, but some of the uh, qualifications required by the UK are much higher. So very often when you visit an abattoir, you'll see that the veterinary inspectors are from Spain, and that is because the qualifications are different and they're paid less. Now, there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, insist on UK food inspectors being qualified differently from fully qualified, six years it takes to be a proper vet, but that's what we use here, and that seems to me to be uh, a cornerstone of the problem with abattoir closures, over-regulation and over-qualified food ins uh, meat inspectors. Um, yes, I'd be delighted. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to my friend for giving away. He's making a, an extremely knowledgeable speech about agriculture, as I would expect. But would he agree that um, one of my constituents was prepared to invest a considerable amount of money in portable abattoirs, was actually, so far as I know, that the initiative has been stalled because of excessive regulation? Well, um, I, I'm delighted to say not only am I aware of the portable or mobile abattoir, but a model of it appeared in my house for my, me to have a look at the other day by one of the people supporting this. And that's why um, a more sensible, more practical and more uh, affordable veterinary inspection <coughs> regime is what's needed. And then we could have the mobile abattoirs back. Yes, I'll give way again. If I could just gently say to my honourable friend, it wasn't only the veterinary uh, inspections, it was the planning, it was the hygiene, it was the safety. Every sort of regulation under the sun has made it stall so far. Indeed, but um, the mobile abattoir didn't require planning because it was mobile. The um, cleanliness and hygiene is, is essential for confidence in human, uh, con for human consumption. But the veterinary bit, that's the bit where there's at least some margin for improvement. Because when I looked into slaughtering through that particular abattoir, the cost was very, very high because of the, the veterinary inspection rather than the other things, which of course have to be dealt with. So I completely support the project uh, that he's referred to, and I hope to see far more little abattoirs popping up, albeit mobile or like the one that closed in Gower um, uh, on, on a fixed basis. Um, but the thing I'm... Did someone want to give way? I'd be delighted. Uh, the, the, the man with the answer on abattoirs. <laughs> <laughs> ah, if only. Um, I should remind the House, first of all, that my wife is actually a practising member of the Royal Co College of Veterinary Surgeons, and indeed my younger son is three rent checks away from following in her footsteps. It, the Honourable Gentleman does make a good point, and it is a significant point, about the uh, nature of the regulation around abattoirs. But uh, there are other forces at play here, in particular market forces. The reason why we've seen the consolidation of abattoirs is that as a consequence of that, it, it produces a lower th unit cost for throughput. That comes back to his earlier point about the demands of the, uh, of the supermarkets uh, and indeed their determination to drive down farm gate prices. Mm -hmm. So would he agree with me that actually this is another thing that the Groceries Code adjudicator could actually mm -hmm. perform a, a significant role in if it had the sufficient powers? And if he's interested in that, he may wish to join me in the adjournment debate tomorrow evening. Yeah. <laughs> I can think of nothing nicer than joining the Honourable Gentleman in all sorts of debates. He was a first-class uh, Deputy Chief Whip in the Coalition Government. And of course, he's absolutely right in what he says about abattoirs too. However, um, I think that, that uh, I congratulate his son from being three checks away from qualification. It is no small achievement to be a vet, and, uh, and so uh, he deserves our congratulations. But moving on, the one thing the government has done right, and I'm really delighted with, is the statutory food security index, moving it to an annual event, because all of this, whether, whether you agree with me that we should have a health index or a food security index, they will come together and we will see that our 60% figure is too low. This is 60% of the food that we eat 
is produced here. That's 60% of the food that we could produce. So there is a 40% potential for farmers to fill that void. And if you look at the world price of wheat, they're not going to be doing it at this rate. Um, it, is, it is very, very difficult for some of our farmers to make any money. In 2022, the value of imports of feed, food and drink was £58.1 billion, over double the value of exports of feed, food and drink for the same year. And it's an enormous sum which could be directed towards British farmers if we supported them to feed our country. The other thing I'd like to see is tax breaks as well as grants. I think grants are very limited and tax breaks are a much more efficient way of getting farmers to cut their costs and compete with farmers abroad. The government recently announced a £427 million grant for farming, and that's welcome, but it's fundamentally misunderstanding the sector. We like to use second-hand machinery in farming, but the grant system doesn't permit this. A better solution would be to offer tax breaks to farmers to allow them to keep their hard-earned capital to invest as they wish. Uh, the capital would also go towards new technologies to generate efficiencies, increase yields and combat the negative impacts of extreme weather. One of, one of my constituents wanted to buy a hot drying machine from Germany, so she applied for the grant. It was such an expensive machine, it was more than half a million pounds, that it blew through the system. There was no way they could approve it. So in the end she bought it herself and um, the hop sector is tiny, but that's why these grants just can't tick the boxes. They do have to be uh, much more comprehensive because when we talk about farming in here, we just talk about it generally. When you're on the ground, each sector is completely different and a hop growing machine is, no di is completely different from a black currant picking machine. And that's all very well, but your cattle crush nowadays is very different from the one that I could afford to buy uh, and is uh, much more impressive. And, and all this technology, the desire to bring in robot fruit pickers, yeah, that'd be great. We've already got robot milkers, but actually the robot milkers that we need are the ones that would work on a rotary parlour instead of on an individual basis. So give us the tax breaks and we will do the work. Don't tell us how to spend our money because the grant system is not efficient. Uh, 70% of the land in England is managed by growers and farmers, and we are often overlooked in the work that we could and do do on combating flooding. One of the lowest pieces of low-hanging fruit is to allow local authorities to let their farmers clear the flood um, blockages. Uh, most farmers have got a, a digger, most farmers have got a bulldozer of some sort, they've got the kit, and it's there where the flood is. But, oh no, 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 they're not allowed to do anything because they're not insured. That's just mad. Let's make sure that local authorities can authorise a farmer to get in his tractor, put the snow plough on and clear the road. It's not that hard, but it does seem to be for my local authority. Mind you, to be fair, Mr Deputy Speaker, almost everything is very hard for Heritage County Council. Um, right, so uh, the Environment Agency could also do a great deal more. Just one little thing that would really help. The River Wye has got phosphates in. The phosphates are coming from chicken muck. There is a man in my constituency who has spent a lot of money on building a phosphate stripping plant. So the chicken muck comes in, goes through the anaerobic digester, the digestate is stripped of its phosphate, and then the muck can go back on the fields. At £300 a tonne, nitrogen fertiliser is very, very expensive. At £18 a tonne delivered to your farm, chicken muck is a much better alternative. So if we want to stop the pollution, we need the Environment Agency to permit things like phosphate stripping so that people can get on with putting proper fertiliser on, muck, instead of buying in fossil fuel-based fertiliser from countries like Russia. So there's all sorts of little things the Environment Agency can do instead of putting my constituents in prison. Um, right, diversification would benefit from a less rigid planning system, which of course you are, uh, which of course the government is thinking about at the moment. It's counterintuitive when this development will be helpful, and so I really welcome the Prime Minister's re recent comments to allow greater diversification in farming, and I look forward to seeing the legislation in, in April. And last, I think one or two people have already talked about the need for connectivity. 46% of rural 
deprived areas are not spots for 5G, including most of my constituency. The NFU uh, found that 79% of their respondents did not have a reliable mobile signal on their farms. How can we possibly fill in our forms and uh, drive our tractors on GPS when we can't get a mobile phone signal? We also need better digital mapping. At the moment, the maps uh, that the RPA are using are not accurate for hedgerows. And the work needed for hedgerows is even harder because by the time you've filled out your digital map, put in your SFI forms, oh dear, you're not allowed to do anything to your hedges because of the wild birds. So then you have to wait, and then the patch comes up again that when you can do stuff to your hedges, but you can't do the same thing for hedge laying as you can for hedge cutting. So it's hard, complicated, and then some bright spot thought we'd plant trees in the hedges, and that's absolutely fine until somebody crashes into one, and then you have a fatality. So hedges are very helpful for many reasons, but not many of them are quite right in the SFI at the moment. Uh, lastly, transport infrastructure for rural communities and livestock worrying. 63% decrease in the percentage of under 25s managing farms, and that has got to change. We are all getting older, and that knowledge, and you saw it on Clarkson's farm when Caleb carved a cow, it isn't easy. If you don't know what you're doing, you can't do it. And you will then have to call the vet, and that will spoil all your economics. We've seen it again and again on our television. People need to know what they're doing with agriculture. It is exceptionally dangerous. If you get your fingers in the PTO, you will lose your whole arm. If you try and do things that don't work and turn your tractor over, you will die. And even if you do it all right, and you're on your own for weeks on end with very little contact, you may well choose to take your life. I have lost six farmers in my constituency in the last 12 months. So things are not all right. There is no room for complacency. And some of the good things that the government is doing are so welcome. Not least, um, while I'm on a cheerful note, my right honourable friend has got a dog yeah, protection yeah. of livestock bill coming through. We really need yeah, to see yeah. this. There is nothing more miserable than lambing a Schmellenberg lamb than coming back and seeing the remains of your flock torn to beds by one of these pit bulls. It's absolutely appalling, and that's why um, I really support that, uh, that private member's bill. Um, the, the, the damage done to livestock in my constituency in the, in the Midlands alone was £313,000. So this is a really serious problem, and I, I'm delighted she's doing that. I'm delighted the government is maintaining its £2.4 billion annual budget, but it should be increasing it. That is the money that keeps us standing still. It is not going to be sufficient to compete with our European uh, competitors or indeed other countries. We need more money, we need it delivered through tax breaks, and we need to make sure that British farmers are supported at every level by honesty and food labelling. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Order. Um, could I gently suggest that there are a significant number of members wishing to participate? <coughs> if every member speaks for half an hour, then not everybody is going to get in. <laughs> Stephen Bonner. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today's debate, uh, of course, had to be rescheduled, but we still welcome what is still a timely debate on farming. The SNP will always welcome any opportunity to speak on this issue and especially to give Scottish farmers a voice in this place. I'd like to talk today about the vital role farmers and farming play in the rich fabric of Scottish tradition, to outline the key impact that Scottish farmers have on our nation's economy, the health of our people and the protection and management of our environment, and to detail just some of the mounting pressures they face due to largely this Conservative government's long-held obsession with Brexit. This debate is timely for several reasons, Mr Deputy Speaker. The first is that a fortnight ago, the Prime Minister spoke at the NFU's annual conference. Now, brave is a word that absolutely nobody would attribute to the current Prime Minister, but he is the first Tory Prime Minister to address the conference since 1992 and the first UK Prime Minister since 2008. And if any in this chamber or indeed any of our constituents were looking for a more telling insight on Westminster's attitude to farming and agriculture, then they need to look no further than that. And I can't help but wonder what it was that kept the Tory leadership away from such a meeting for so long. Why is it that despite having four Prime Ministers in that time, the current Prime Minister is the first in 28 years to make such a commitment? 
although, of course, in the interests of fairness, it is only right that we acknowledge the fact that the Prime Minister's immediate predecessor was not in our office long enough to have received an invitation. So, what might have been the cause of that historical hiatus? Perhaps it was a long-held tradition of successive Tory governments taking the rural vote and communities for granted. Perhaps it was a fear of scrutiny from the sector itself. Or perhaps it was the crippling knowledge that the Tory obsession with Brexit is playing the defining role in the decline of our once great agricultural industries. Or indeed, probably a combination of all three. Mr Deputy Speaker, we on these benches believe that the Prime Minister's address to the NFU should have begun with an outright apology. The Westminster Government have hammered farmers with its Brexit obsession, leaving them to fend for themselves, facing the devastating impact of higher costs, mountains of red tape, labour shortages and eye-watering delays over border controls. I will indeed. Member for giving away, and alongside uh, the right honourable member here for Orkney and Shetland, I'm grateful to be here as a Scottish MP who can also give voice to Scottish uh, farmers. Uh, he's making uh, uh, good points in relation to Brexit, and I agree with him on that. But I wonder if he might agree with me in relation to the importance of skills for farming and having skills yeah. and training um, where uh, the communities are is really important. The SRUC received a Queen's Anniversary Award for Innovation uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was in London to see that. But Elmwood campus for our SRUC yeah. in Cooper is facing devastating cuts, largely as a result of the Scottish Government's cuts to HE and FE. Um, it is going to have its golf course sold off, and there are doubts over the future of this animal care unit. Does he agree with me that the SRUC is an integral part of Cooper and that the Scottish Government should be helping the SRUC yeah, yeah. to provide funding to keep yeah. it there as a going concern? Honourable Member for a, uh, and I, do, I do agree with her and I will make uh, representations as such. And of course, I look forward to all uh, contributions in the Chamber from all members across Scotland today as well. The debate is actually timely as well as we, of course, finally saw the UK government responding to decade-long calls for fairer contracts for dairy farmers. Since as long ago as 2011, NFU Scotland, on behalf of its members, had been desperately pushing for reform in this area. So we welcome the bringing forward of legislation to regulate dairy contracts. But we join NFU Scotland and other unions in highlighting the devastating delay showed by the Westminster government and listening to our daily farmers in that sector. Mr Deputy Speaker, farming is vital to the Scottish economy. The sector in Scotland delivers a production output of £3.3 billion annually. It employs 67,000 workers directly on farm and supports a further 300,000 jobs within agricultural activities and, of course, has long been the backbone of rural communities in Scotland and our surrounding landscapes. We are a nation with a proud agricultural history, with crofters, growers and farmers shaping global methods of food production which are still practised today. Scottish salmon, Aberdeen Angus, oat-based products and, of course, Scotch whisky all represent modern success stories for our resilient food and drink sector. Exports of these Scottish products and others reached a total export value of £8 billion in 2022. But while these products have success in common, they are also united by a far darker shared trait. Their newfound precarious position, a result of Brexit red tape, staffing shortages and poorly negotiated trade deal, which has left them vulnerable to cheap importations. Our farmers, growers and crofters are resilient. They have been this way for centuries. They have had to be forging a livelihood in often remote and weather-beaten locations and feeding the people of Scotland and those far beyond our shores. But while they are resilient, Madam Deputy Speaker, they are struggling. Scottish farmers deserve far better than the blatant disregard and damage they continue to receive from Westminster. And while Labour in Wales and the Tories here in England fail to deliver for farmers, with EU replacement support schemes falling far short of what was promised, the SNP Scottish Government has provided the most generous package of support for farmers and crossers across the UK. 
We are lucky that, as a devolved matter, we can make these interventions back in Scotland. We can try our best to support this vital part of our economy, our history and, indeed, our culture. But with both the main parties here in Westminster in lockstep for their support of Brexit and the damage it is doing, the Scottish Government's support for farmers in Scotland can only do so much. It can only stretch so far. And we aspire to much more than mitigating against the worst of this place. The general nature of today's debate makes it hard for us to shortlist all of the damage this place is doing to farming communities. There are many areas of farming which deserve to be debated on the floor of this House. But I would like to touch on just some of those issues, and perhaps members will uh, detect an underlying theme which connects each of them. And we'll start with animal welfare. It has been raised already in the debate, and it is a matter which members on all benches will know is of huge importance to myself and us in the SNP. This Tory government likes to talk about standards and the world-leading role that they see us playing on the global stage. And it is true, Madam Deputy Speaker, Scottish farmers have some of the highest animal welfare standards in the world, thanks largely, of course, to the Welfare of Farmed Animal Regulation introduced by the Scottish Government in 2010. But the actions of the Conservative Government here in Westminster since Brexit have made an absolute mockery of their own claims to be concerned about animal welfare. For example, the Free Trade Agreement struck with Australia uh, in 2021 does not honour the Westminster Government's supposed commitment to not undercut our own farmers through unfair competition. We were sold that deal on the laughable pitch that it would save consumers up to £34 million a year, 52 pence per person, a measly 52 pence per person. And at what cost? Madam Deputy Speaker, a cost to our own farmers whose high animal welfare standards go unrewarded and, in fact, are used as a penalty by being undercut by imports <laughs> of a far lower standard. And at a cost, of course, to the planet as we fly goods across the world rather than support local food economies. Surely, Madam Deputy Speaker, the time has come for the UK Government to listen to calls from farmers all across Scotland as well as organisations like the Land Workers Alliance, whose Scottish policy team, led by Dr Tara White, have provided invaluable insights to the Scottish Government in shaping our enforced post-Brexit agricultural direction through recent consultation. And organisations like Compassion and World Farming are calling for a smarter, more ethical approach to rewarding farmers through core minimum standards for animal welfare as a condition of any tariff or quota-free trade deal or through efficient labelling so consumers can be better informed on the origin and the welfare standards of the product that they are going to consume, or indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker, through a localised approach to supply bolstering local food economies. Nobody needs reminded of the impacts of the pandemic and revealing weaknesses in our over-reliance on long supply chains and those which rely on the international trade, or of the importance of local food supply systems in meeting our domestic needs. This need for shorter supply chains is, of course, only compounded by the climate crisis and important food from other countries, especially those as far away as Australia, will only serve to ta- uh, increase greenhouse gas emissions, and of course that contradicts any UK government claim that they are tackling climate challenge head on. Another issue of concern to all of us in the SNP is the cost of our food and the unavoidable reality that while costs for consumers rise, the share of that cost which finds its way to our farmers remains completely stagnant. The Centre of Economic Performance has stated that leaving the European Union added an average of £210 per household to food bills over the two years to the end of 2021. That's the legacy of this place. And this was, of course, before the Tory party elected their previous leader, whose reckless relationship with economic reality heaped further costs on each and every one of our constituents. And for any members who need to be reminded of the impact of the Tory engineered crisis, ONS data shows that the overall price of food rose around 25 per cent between January 22 and January 24. In the 10 years prior to this, food prices only rose by 9 per cent in total. 
but we know that farmers have not benefited from these price increases. In fact, the opposite is true. Farmers are paying higher costs for essentials such as feed and fertiliser. And research by Professor Lisa Jack, carried out for Sustain, found that of the entire price you might pay for one grocery item, around 98 or 99 per cent of that goes to production and overheads for intermediary uh, companies such as processors and distributors, and then, of course, the retailers, meaning our farmers, our crofters and growers are left with crumbs, sometimes as little as one penny of profit for each item that they produce. So we'll take this opportunity, Madam Deputy Speaker, to ask the Minister once again to consider price caps to stop the supermarkets profiteering and to help ensure that basic essentials are not beyond the reach of many people. Better still, the UK Government could have follow calls from organisations like Sustain and force supermarkets to publish more information about their own supply chains. We in the SNP are absolutely clear that farmers must be paid what they are owed because they provide a secure, fair and sustainable future for family farms across all of these nations. We urgently need to review existing frameworks which are supposed to enshrine this fairness which are, uh, which are not acting as well as they should. And this includes looking at the efficacy of the grocery, uh, grocery supply code of practice. Madam Deputy Speaker, another issue raised by the SNP in this place consistently is the crippling effect of Brexit on the ability of our farmers to staff their farms. The UK currently relies on some 58,000 seasonal workers to harvest the crops grown by our current dom domestic system, and that is before we count on those working in the wider food production and farming system. Despite constant warnings from farmers and unions in Scotland during the referendum and indeed after, Brexit has had a devastating impact on the ability of farmers to find staff at peak times of their harvest cycle. Despite the introduction of temporary short-term visas for workers from overseas to fill these roles, there remain significant issues around immigration and especially when it comes to seasonal workers those forced to work in food manufacturing and, of course, as we have heard previously, work those working in abattoirs. The introduction of those short-term visas will not only fall to address working shortages in agriculture and food production in Scotland, also pose another serious challenge. The complexities of the system and associated costs of the move to the UK mean that many of these workers are now often at the sharpest end of exploitation, a great deal of which occurs in the application process itself, with third parties taking advantage of applicants trying and struggling to navigate the UK's system. So what have we been left with? An immigration system which allows for exploitation at its outset, which has not been able to effectively fill the vacancies, and a hostile environment created by the attitude of this Tory government, which deters workers with the appropriate skill set from even considering coming here to the UK to carry out that work. And I said earlier, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are consistent themes running, uh, that emanate from here in Westminster. Those themes are the painful reality with the people of Scotland have become all too familiar. Tory chaos, Tory mismanagement and the enduring damage of Brexit, which threatens to decimate our hard-working and admirably resilient farmers in Scotland. In stark contrast, the SNP stands up for Scottish farmers. Wherever we can, on matters that are fully devolved, we have given clarity and assurances that we will support our farming industry. We have introduced the Agriculture and Rural Communities Bill, which is a key milestone in our work to transform how we support farming and food production in Scotland to become a global leader in sustainable and regenerative agriculture. And in a final example of the differences between the clear leadership being shown in Scotland and the approach favoured down here, in his address to the NFU Scottish Conference, the First Minister announced the Scottish Government has now committed up to 70 per cent of the budget being made available through tiers one and two of the frameworks. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, to today's debate has been uh, welcomed and it is incredibly important. Farmers in Scotland are close to breaking point and despite the constant commitment of support from the Scottish Government, there is only so much we can do to clean up the mess that has been left by the Tory Government. Whilst this Government continues to bury its head in the sand, we in the SNP will continue to work hard to secure the fair and sustainable future that Scottish family farms deserve. But there is only one way to properly address the challenges that farmers are facing and support and protect Scotland's agricultural history. And it is for an independent Scotland to take its place within the European Union. And only one party is making the case for this, the SNP. Thank you. George Eustace. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I begin by drawing attention to my members' uh, register of interest in that I'm a trustee uh, of a family trust that owns shares in Travascus Farm, our family farming business, and I'm also a director of Penbroth, uh, which is a, a consultancy in the sector. Um, and I wanted to start my comments by addressing the current year, because it is always the current year, the year that farmers are in, that is at the top of their minds. And as the Shadow Secretary of State pointed out, it has undoubtedly been a very difficult year uh, for farmers this year. Difficult principally because of the weather. Uh, this has been one of the wettest winters uh, on record. Um, it, it affects different parts uh, of the country, but this has been more widespread <coughs> than, for instance, the, um, the, the bad flooding that we had in 2020, uh, or the more localised but, but much more severe flooding that we saw in 2014. It means that a lot of winter arable crops have struggled to establish. It, it means that in areas like my own constituency, which is home to most of the UK's cauliflower production. Uh, producers of cauliflowers in Cornwall have had the most difficult year uh, in living memory this year. So it's been a difficult time over the last uh, 12 months, particularly this winter. And it is also true that in recent years, a number of global events have led to volatility. And in common with many other business sectors, farmers have sometimes, sometimes felt it uh, difficult to plan uh, and to budget properly because of uh, volatility that they saw uh, in their input costs. And it's also the case that this year, uh, over the last 12 months, some sectors have seen commodity prices ease back from the very high levels recorded in the last few years. And this is particularly pronounced in some areas of cereal production, uh, like winter wheat. So while acknowledging that it has been a difficult year for farmers and that that is at the top of their mind. I also think it is very important to take a step back and to look at the wider context and to look at a longer time frame. Because DEFRA, of course, uh, constantly monitors farm business incomes. Uh, every year they publish something called the Farm Business Survey. And there is a whole statistics department in DEFRA, as the Minister will know, uh, who spend their time uh, understanding global agricultural commodity markets, uh, what's driving prices up or down, and what the impact of that is on UK farm enterprises. And on this, um, in recent years, we have to acknowledge that farm incomes have actually risen sharply overall since 2016. And that is because farm gate prices throughout history have always been heavily influenced by exchange rates. And the sharp devaluation of sterling against the euro after the 2016 referendum result, literally uh, within seconds of it becoming uh, apparent what was uh, likely to happen on that evening, uh, we saw anybody who is in a productive sector, be that primary industry or manufacturing, uh, benefit from a slightly softer exchange rate. And, and throughout our history, this has always been the case. The people who make things and produce things tend to do better when you have a weaker exchange rate against the euro and the dollar, and people who import things uh, or are in the financial services sector tend to prefer a stronger exchange rate. And because of that exchange rate change, between 2016 and 2022, profits on the average dairy farm uh, more than doubled uh, to over £200,000 last year. Uh, and that's more than four times higher than the average dairy farm was getting in 2015, uh, when dairy prices really were on the floor and they really were struggling. It's also true that global turbulence following the terrible invasion uh, of Ukraine has led to sharp increases uh, in global uh, cereal prices. And that means that for the average cereal farm, gross profit margins per hectare 
actually trebled in the few years up to 2022, although, as I've already acknowledged, and for any angry, dairy, uh, any angry cereal farmers listening to this, it's also the case that those cereal prices uh, have fallen sharply in this current year. And it's also, of course, something that I recognise, that it has not been a universally positive picture. Overall, farm incomes have been healthy from 2016 to 2022. But the pig sector in particular suffered difficulties in 2021, caused by oversupply in the EU market and problems in the Chinese export market. Uh, our apple industry uh, suffers a long-standing problem of uh, an inability, it would seem, to break through in export markets, uh, leaving this industry that requires investment over many years, uh, if not decades, uh, at the mercy of all too powerful <coughs> retail customers. Uh, the potato industry has also uh, suffered several years in the doldrums, uh, partly due to changing consumer tastes and reduction in demand uh, for potatoes. Um, and it's also finally the case, Madam <coughs> Deputy Speaker, that some of the graving, grazing livestock sectors, uh, not just in more vulnerable upland landscapes, but also in lowland areas too, have seen their profits uh, typically moving sideways, not really increasing, uh, and, and in some years dipping slightly. So the overall picture for agriculture from 2016 is a positive one, and it's important to recognise that. Uh, farmers won't always volunteer the fact that they've had good years when they have good years. But for those of us in this House who are interested in coherent policy making, it's important that we at least understand the data and the statistics. And that is why I was particularly pleased that the Farming Minister published uh, the data and the trends um, late last year. Now, I want to say a little bit about the current agriculture policy that the government's uh, pursuing, and that's because most of the key tenets of that policy were developed between 2017 and 2019, when I was the Minister of State for Agriculture, and implemented from 2020 uh, to 2023, when I was the Secretary of State uh, in the Department. And there are a number of principles that we brought to that policy, as we had a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rethink farming policy from first principles. And the first is that there was no long-term place uh, for land subsidies. That's to say, the single farm payment, area payments, direct payments, whatever you wish to call them, these were essentially a subsidy paid to people for owning land. And there was no coherence to such a policy, simply because there has never been any shortage of people in this country wanting to buy land, and it made no sense to add a subsidy to it. There's also a lot of evidence that around 50% of that subsidy payment, uh, when it was introduced in 2005, uh, actually went in inflated rents. And so all that happened when you introduced a land subsidy is the people who were the ultimate owners of that land benefited most. And it's why we ended up with a problem uh, that 50% of the entire agriculture budget went to 10% of the wealthiest landowners in the country. Meanwhile, 44,000 farmers more than half the cohort claiming BPS had just 10% of the total between them. And that made no sense. So the second principle that we brought is that as well as paying farmers for what they do, rather than just paying them for happening to own land, there should be a profit margin in what we ask them to do. So we took a very deliberate decision to depart from the backward income foregone methodology that was pursued by the European Union and is sometimes advocated by the World Trade Organization. As we try to modernize farm policy, we have to reject some of the anachronistic uh, approaches that the World Trade Organization uh, advocates. They have no place uh, for modern policy. And it is essential that if we're going to ask farmers to give up uh, a land subsidy in exchange for being paid for what they do, we should not begrudge them a margin for what they do. There has to be a profit margin. That is the quid pro quo for the removal of anachronistic land subsidies. The third principle that we brought uh, in the design of that policy was that recognising that there was poor profitability in some farm sectors and recognising too that in some areas there was a dependence uh, on the subsidies that were received. We should try to address the cause of that poor profitability, not simply treat the symptoms of it. And that is why in the Agriculture Act we legislated uh, for new powers to introduce fairness in the supply chain. And it's why in the years since we've had a significant expansion in grants 
to help farmers invest in their businesses, to reduce costs and improve their profitability. And it's why, as we design schemes like the Sustainable Farming Incentive, we made sure that as well as helping the environment, some of those schemes would also increase and improve the financial resilience of farms, because there's a lot of evidence that in some landscapes, if you can have an approach to farming that is more extensive, that has fewer inputs, um, but actually um, a, 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 a higher profit margin, you can actually see an overall improvement in the profitability and long-term financial resilience of some of those enterprises. Now, the fourth principle that I was very keen to bring uh, to this policy, but I know others have commented that we didn't do this far enough, and I'm open to representations on that, but it was that there should be simplicity in the new schemes. And this is not easy, because the environment is complex. Uh, and whenever you try to design a scheme that delivers for the environment, it's always going to be limited uh, by the extent of human understanding and the ability uh, to make payments that you can then track uh, and validate in some way that they've been uh, delivered. And that is not straightforward, as I discovered uh, when I got into this. I'm somebody who campaigned to leave. I was very hostile to the cross-compliance regime uh, and the, the way that the European Union approached these things. I was very keen to bring simplicity to it. And my message always to officials is that as we encounter a dilemma and a difficulty as we design policy, we should always tack towards simplicity and accept that it might not be perfect, but that we need something um, that works. And I think generally, to be fair to officials, they have uh, done that. And to be fair to ministers, they've, they've maintained uh, that basic principle going forward. The final principle, <coughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, was that this should be an evolution, not a revolution. And that is why, way back in 2018, when I first tried to take the Agriculture Act through uh, Parliament, in that case we didn't complete it and we had to have a second attempt in the uh, Parliament that followed after the 2019 election, but we were explicit right from the beginning that there would be a seven-year transition from 2021 to 2028, that we would gradually uh, reduce the legacy BPS land subsidies and gradually expand and roll out the new policies. And you know, it's sometimes said that, oh well, there hasn't been a plan, um, things have delayed, things aren't happening as fast as they should have done. All of these representations, I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, are complete and utter nonsense. We published a document in 2019 that set out uh, that seven-year transition plan. And I want to pay tribute to all of my successors because every single one of them has continued to roll out that policy program exactly as we set out uh, in 2019. And indeed, uh, just late last year, the government confirmed that they would de-link the remaining legacy payments from the need to have tenure over land in this current year, 2024. And that is exactly what we plan to do as long ago as 2019. And every different component of the new agriculture policy, from the sustainable farming incentive uh, to the landscape recovery project and others, have been rolled out exactly as we intended. And I want, Madam Deputy Speaker, to also pay tribute to the many DEFRA officials who've maintained that trajectory that we outlined in 2019. In particular, uh, Janet Hughes, who's uh, led that team for a number of years, and I think having that continuity uh, on the policy programme has been helpful. And I also want to take this opportunity um, to pay tribute to Tim Morden, who is a long-standing official in DEFRA, who's helped ministers from all sides of this House over many, many years and who I understand will uh, soon be retiring from the department. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I want to now say a little bit uh, about um, what the challenges are that remain, because there are some, and I will uh, wind up soon after that. Uh, now most of the challenges that DEFRA faces when it comes to agriculture, I'm afraid to say, are other government departments. Um, and the first uh, of those departments is the Home Office. Um, when I was the Secretary of State, we put in place the Shropshire Review that concluded that we actually needed to have a visa scheme, not only for the agriculture sector, and that that should be a multi-annual visa scheme for seasonal workers in farming, but that also we needed to look at a visa scheme as well, a more progressive approach, if you like, uh, on some sectors such as uh, food manufacturing. And I regret to say that there's not yet been uh, a response to that Shropshire Review, I have to say, in raising this, I'm placing no blame at the 
uh, feet of ministers in DEFRA, since I was a minister in DEFRA, uh, and I know uh, how these things work. And while ministers won't be able to say so, it's pretty obvious that the Home Office, as usual, are the intransigent uh, blockage uh, in this problem. And what we really need to see, Madam Deputy Speaker, in my view, is a machinery of government change, where the Home Office is stripped of its powers when it comes uh, to visa policy for seasonal agricultural workers, so that the policy in its entirety is simply moved to DEFRA, and DEFRA ministers no longer have to waste their time trying to explain things to Home Office ministers, which is often where the problem lies. A number of honourable members have mentioned um, trade, and on the Department for Business and Trade, I would simply say this to ministers. Uh, DEFRA understands trade uh, and some of the technical issues around trade far better than officials in the Department for Business uh, and Trade. Um, DEFRA ministers are armed um, with real intellectual power within DEFRA, real experience of dealing with trade negotiations. And I hope that current ministers and any other aspiring ministers in this place will always draw on the power that they have uh, within DEFRA in order to face down some of the more you know, naive approaches that we've seen in the past from the Department for Business and Trade. I would say as well that we must keep payment rates under review. Uh, I actually increased the payment rates for the Sustainable Farming Incentive and Countryside yeah, yeah, Stewardship well by about 30% uh, in the final year that I was in the role. I know that ministers recently have increased it by a further 10%, and it may be that we need to consider going further too as we depart from the anachronistic income foregone uh, methodology. And now a number of honourable members have mentioned the issue around uh, land use, and the Shadow Secretary of State mentioned the land use framework. I'm more optimistic about our ability to both increase agricultural output and make space uh, in our farmed landscape for nature. And that is because we know, and we've done the research on this, there is no direct correlation between food production and land um, area used. And that's because 35% of our agricultural output comes from just 4% of the land. And that's because you have sectors like pigs and poultry and horticulture that are high value outputs uh, but don't use a huge amount of land. And, and at the other end of the scale, we also know that there's around 20% of farmland in England that produces just 3 or 4% of our total output. So you don't, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious that you can actually make space for nature, do some tree planting, uh, restore some of those vulnerable habitats like peatland, but also as well invest in things like uh, new horticulture, glass houses uh, and other crops to expand uh, your domestic food production and enhance your food security. Uh, and on uh, that particular point of horticulture, I regret that the government took a decision uh, last year to drop the horticulture strategy. Uh, I do know that they've reinstated elements of it and that's to be welcomed. But the reason we committed to a new focus on horticulture, and in particular a new generation of glass houses uh, when it came to our food production, is that in my nine years in DEFRA, I spent a lot of time in COBRA meetings dealing with the latest crisis that might have been going on, um, whether it was a ferry strike uh, in France, uh, right up to COVID and preparing for a no-deal Brexit. And the issue always came down to how we would get lettuces and tomatoes from Spain into this country through the short straits. And if we really wanted to enhance our food security, we should have a renewed focus on horticulture and try to reshore some of that glasshouse production that was wrongly exported to the Netherlands when we joined the European Union all those decades ago. And finally, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to see more done to support new entrants and tenant farmers. I think the Rock Review was a, an excellent piece of work. There were many, many different recommendations in there. But if there was one recommendation that I hope the government would consider taking forward, it's the idea of an assignable agreement when it comes to countryside stewardship, so that if somebody enters land tenure for maybe two or three years, uh, they will actually be able to assign their agreement to an incoming tenant or indeed to the existing landowner. That is the only solution I can see uh, to that particular uh, problem. But thank you very much. Ben Lick. Speaker, it's a pleasure to participate in this very important and timely debate, and a, a particular pleasure to follow the right honourable member for Camborn and Redruth, who I thought made a very considered uh, speech, as ever. He's very learned uh, in this uh, particular policy field, and I'd like to actually elaborate a little bit and follow on on his uh, one of his final points there about food security and especially the 
the emphasis on uh, horticulture and reshoring some of that uh, production in the UK because I think food security is something that um, doesn't always uh, get the attention it demands uh, in this place and indeed in, in wider political debate. It's a very important matter, of course, of life and death, um, but it, it is something that I feel uh, warrants even more uh, parliamentary scrutiny and debate in future. But if we begin then by, by considering the current um, state of affairs, and in that regard, the UK Government's food security report is incredibly useful. It sets out the current situation as regards food production and food consumption, as well as exports and, and imports. And I was quite taken uh, by some of its findings that um, the UK's production to supply ratio, for example, uh, of, for all food in 2020 was from 60% um, and 76% for indigenous uh, type food. Um, perhaps more relevant um, and wider, more widely understood, of course, is the actual consumption of UK produced food. And that uh, statistic stands closer to 54%, um, as of course part of, of UK food products uh, are exported. Now, the, the point I, I make on this now is statistics, they're very hard to interpret and sometimes can tell uh, a whole array of different uh, stories. The one thing I would say about that 54% uh, of uh, UK produced food actually consumed is that it compares to a 1984 figure of 78%. Now, changing uh, dietary preferences, changing climate, different uh, consumer habits, what have you, have a, a very heavy bird bearing on this story. But the trend, I think, is quite important, that from a peak in the mid-1980s, the production to supply ratio has declined into the early 2000s and has, and has remained quite stable ever since. Of course, food security is not a, a simple matter. It is multifaceted and, have, and has various different uh, contingent factors. But the, again, the UK government's food security report has a very useful definition, which I think conveys the complexity. Food security, it, it notes, encompasses the state of global agriculture and markets on which the UK is reliant, the sources of raw materials and foodstuffs in the UK and abroad, the manufacturing, wholesale and retail industries that ultimately bring food to shelves and plates, and their complex supply chains of inputs and logistics, and the systems of inspection that allow consumers to be confident that their food is safe, authentic and of a high standard. Now, if we consider that definition for a moment, as detailed as it is, immediately a few risks to food security spring to mind. We've heard some of them already in this debate uh, this evening. We've heard of the surge uh, in output, uh, sorry, input uh, prices um, and costs of commodities and the way that that has had a, a big influence on the viability of farm businesses. Um, we've also heard about um, changing climate in the UK and the way in which flooding has had a, a significant uh, impact on agricultural production in the UK. But I also think it's quite important to bear in mind that the impact of a changing climate will also have an impact on those markets abroad uh, from which the UK imports so much of its food. And especially uh, of relevance here is that, as the Right Honourable Member who spoke before me outlined, different sectors will be more exposed to these uh, uh, import markets or these foreign markets than others. If we take, for example, the fruit and vegetable uh, sector as, as a particular case in point. We depend quite a bit on foreign markets for our uh, fruit and veg. The UK produces over 50% of vegetables consumed domestically, but only 16% of our fruit. And 93% of domestic consumption of fresh vegetables was fulfilled by domestic and European production, while fruit supply uh, is more widely spread across the EU, Africa, the Americas and the UK. Now, some of these foreign markets are those areas of the world in which we know will suffer from climate change and their ability to produce much of this food, uh, food uh, that we import will be impacted uh, by climate change. And that's not to consider, of course, the impact that uh, the unknown impact of geopolitical instability will have on some of these uh, supply chains. You know, the war in Ukraine has already been mentioned, but we need also remember, of course, that some of these shocks are unexpected and we cannot anticipate, such as, for example, the disruption more recently uh, in the Red Sea trade routes. And so for that reason, I, I very much welcome the government's commitment to monitoring uh, food security through this new statutory uh, index. And I think it would warrant then an annual debate to coincide with updates of the index so that we can properly scrutinise this very important matter. Now, if we consider all of these facts um, and potential threats and risks, I think it leads us to this conclusion that actually we need to not only maintain uh, domestic food production, but also actually increase 
food production so that we can gain greater self-sufficiency in many of the food products that UK consumers uh, eat. Now, whilst I focus so far on some of the external factors, we need to bear in mind, of course, there are many domestic factors that have an impact um, on domestic food capacity. And I'm afraid to say that there are a combination of factors that are conspiring at present to force many uh, farmers in Wales out um, of the industry. Now, domestic agricultural support policy, for example, is a very big part to play in this regard, uh, in addition to public procurement of food contract, contracts, which has already been mentioned by another speaker. I'm afraid the financial position of Welsh farms um, just underlines the vulnerability of the sector in Wales and the importance of direct government support payments. Now, IBERS, the research institute at Aberystwyth uh, University in my constituency, uh, produces an annual farm business survey of farm incomes. And the most recent uh, survey detailing the 2022-2023 outturns paints a very worrying picture of the state of many farms uh, and farm models in Wales. It noted how hill cattle and sheep farms made a, a profit of some £24,000 after rent and finance um, in that financial year, but exclu excluding, of course, the cost of unpaid labour. And that compares to the average basic payment scheme payment for those farms of 26,000. Hill sheep farms are paint a similar story. They made a profit after rent and finance of some 24,000 uh, pounds versus a uh, BPS direct support payment of uh, 31,577 pounds. The point I'm trying to make here is that direct support from the government through the BPS in this instance has served an incredibly important role in keeping many of these farms afloat. Yes. And the threat or the concern that I have is when there any reduction uh, to that profit, many of these farms will find themselves unviable. I will, of course. Giving way. Um, he will know well that the Labour government in Wales is currently planning a subsidy scheme, a sustainable farming scheme, which by their own independently commissioned estimates will lead to roughly a 10% drop in livestock and a £122 million drop in revenue. That, that's income that farmers in Aberconwy tell me is simply the difference between them having a future and not. So what message does he have then for his Plaid Cymru colleagues in the Senedd who are propping up that Welsh Labour government through a co cooperation agreement? Does he agree with me that tomorrow afternoon's budget vote might be a good opportunity for them to reconsider that cooperation? I'm very grateful to my uh, honourable friend from Aberconwy for making that intervention. I think he is right to, to state the fears of his farmers. Uh, that are very much aligned with those expressed to me by farmers in Ceredigion, that the change, uh, potential change this policy is, um, quite frankly, uh, the matter of life and death for their businesses. Um, and uh, he, he tempts me to, to comment on uh, some of the potential plans of my colleagues uh, in the Senedd. I'll resist them, but I will uh, say that, uh, <laughs> I will say that um, I think it's important, given the gravity of the situation facing the Welsh agricultural industry, that's important that the SFS is changed. Uh, I would suggest that it should be paused to begin with so that we have time to devise a proper policy that, that is fit for, for the 21st century. Um, and if my colleagues decide that they need to, every, to use every possible lever possible, then I would all power to their elbow. And, and if that means the demise of a cooperation agreement, I certainly shall not be mourning its passing. Um, the point, though, is that the direct support, direct support um, for many of our farm businesses is crucial and, and I think a point was made by the uh, honourable member, right honourable member for North Herefordshire earlier in the debate that much uh, of the reality of some of this support is actually uh, to ensure that uh, uh, food uh, and the price of food on the market, uh, on the supermarket shelves is controlled in a manner. Now, yes, please, yeah. uh, I'm grateful to the honourable member for giving way. He was talking about direct support to farmers and I'm, well, on that subject I'd also like to talk, uh, briefly ask him a question about direct support for local planning authorities, given how vital it is that, that farmers get quick answers from local planning authorities. Uh, my experience in Mid and East Devon is that they are earnest in their desire to prevent agricultural pollution uh, affecting our streams and rivers, but I've had one farmer who's waited 20 months for a decision on a planning application in relation to the construction of a slurry store. Does he agree with me that we need the Westminster Government also to help local planning authorities so that we can get rapid answers to our farmers? 
Well, I thank the other gentleman for that. A very important uh, contribution uh, intervention. I, I think it is quite right. It's something we face in Wales as well, where um, some farm improvements and developments, indeed changes to comply with regulations, find obstacles uh, in delays in planning. I think it's only right that planning authorities are sufficiently resourced to ensure that none of these obstacles are put in the way of, of progress. So I, I think he makes a very good point. If I come very briefly, Madam Deputy Speaker, for concluding, just turn to some of the wider issues that impact on domestic uh, production that I think uh, is worth repeating in this place, and those being the weaknesses of the current uh, grocery supply code of practice and enforcement regime, um, and also then, of course, trade policy. Um, I don't need to remind the House because I can see so many learned members here this evening. Um, but you know, farming is a long-term industry. These decisions have to be make, made on a very long-term basis. Um, and uh, when it comes to the way in which the grocery code, uh, the grocery uh, supply chain operates, I'm afraid to say that it is uh, the case that many of the retailers um, are, have found themselves in a position where they can exert undue influence uh, and impact on uh, farmers and growers uh, on, to shift short-term risk onto their shoulders, uh, much to the detriment of the wider industry. Um, it's been stated in a previous debate in Westminster Hall uh, last month that 95% uh, of the food consumed in the UK is sold by just 12 retailers. Um, which affords them this dominant uh, position in the supply chain. And it means the farmers and growers receive quite a paltry uh, margin when compared to that enjoyed by many of the retailers. Again, a point made far more eloquently by the Right Honourable Member for North Herefordshire. And so in, in addition to short-term inflation spikes and, and rising input uh, costs, farmers are also at the present exposed to some unfair trading practices that arise from this uh, imbalance. Now, at the uh, debate last month, um, many members were present uh, debating a, a, a petition that was brought forward by the River Food Farming Campaign, uh, which called on the government uh, to strengthen the grocery record uh, adjudicators so that it is empowered to take effective and punitive action against those committing unfair trading practices to lower the turnover threshold so that the code applies to a, a greater number of retailers and to enshrine the simple principle that retailers should give suppliers certainty that they will buy what they agreed to buy, pay what they agreed to pay, and to pay on time. What we're talking there, Madam Deputy Speaker, is just basic fairness, yeah. and specifically to spread out some of the risk and also the profit inherent in the food supply system more evenly across the supply chain. Finally, then, um, it has already been mentioned, so I won't go into any detail, but the impact of, of trade policy. And, Concerns have been uh, referenced already about uh, the impact of the Australia free trade deal on uh, the sector in, in Wales and indeed in the UK. All I would want to say in, in addition to what has already been said is that in its approach to future trade policy, the UK government should urgently establish a, a set of core production standards for all food consumed in the UK to ensure that farmers and growers here are not disadvantaged by any future trade agreements. You know, these standards uh, could safeguard high quality Climate-friendly markets are open to imports from countries whose standards may differ from our own. But in addition, we've already mentioned uh, the Food Security Index. The government could look to um, establish an annual free trade agreement assessment uh, to quantify the cumulative impact of free trade agreements on trade balance, sourcing, standards and domestic food production. I know it's something that the farming unions in Wales would very much uh, support. In conclusion, then, Madam Deputy Speaker, what I think with regards to food security, it is a challenge that I, we will need to uh, grapple with uh, quite soon. And I think by supporting uh, domestic production, not only for it to be maintained current levels, but actually to increase production so that we do gain greater self-sufficiency, we will in turn gain greater resilience to climate change, to the shocks also in a very uncertain world. Therese Coffey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's a huge pleasure to contribute to this debate on farming and uh, reflecting on many of the other speeches that have already been made. It just shows how important it is in our national security. Farms' primary purpose is to produce the fine food that we enjoy. And we need them to keep doing that. We need them to have good reward and fair reward for doing that. And we also need their help to protect and conserve the countryside and the natural environment. As the Member of Parliament of Suffolk Coastal, I am blessed to represent such 